Jay Crawford, Adam the Bull, Garrett Bush, Tyvis Powell, Jason Lloyd. Plus, da 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 da, you're loving him, Mikey McNuggets. And so many big names, it would take me hours to say all of their names. The ultimate Cleveland sports show starts now. Booyah! Hey! Happy Monday, <laughs> well, look, Cleveland! Well, look, look here! Who's back. Look who's back in the mix. Vacation's over. <laughs> All good things, they say. Hey, man, you was on the skis. Listen, D, you was on the jet skis. What was you? you was on everything. A lot what? of water, a lot of sun, a lot of relaxation. Man. That's the key. Did you talk, do you, did, when, when you're on vacation, how, how often do you uh, check your, or do you detach? How, how oh, you, I'm detached. So you just turn it off? I'm detached. Turn it, on, turn it off a little bit? And I get more detached every day. Yeah. Like, like even, even in my working life. Right. I find that, and I've talked about this on the show a lot, the more you live in social media, the more you take on the mood of social media, which I yeah. think is dark and negative. I'm a bright, positive person. I try to be. And if I immerse myself in that, I become dark and negative. So I disconnect. And I, I have really, probably over the last maybe three years, mm-hmm. four years, I've just really leaned on it less and less and less. I use it now um, as a work tool, but it's probably, it used to be one or two in my work tool. Now it's like seven or eight. I've got a lot of other ways I can get information. That's called being established. That's, or that's just, you know what, or, or just not caring about oh, oh. like that, that whole, all that noise yeah. that's there. Because no matter what your opinion is, and I'm, this is what really led me to that. No matter what your opinion is on anything, you will find detractors on social media. It's just the way it is. I, I, yes, I took a little advice from him. When, you know, I was, you know, when you, when you're in the grind, you do it seven days a week. You say yes to everything. Yeah. You say yes to every interview, every yep. every speaking engagement, every. Look, I, you don't want to miss an opportunity at, at all. But and then it comes to a point where it becomes counterproductive. Sure. Because your health goes down, your your mental health, like you just every single day. I used to wake up, and and if it was a day I was off, I would wake up with like this, this like deep. I would break up like, oh my gosh, like I missed something. Like I, it's I, the FOMO. I, yeah, that's like, what every. But that's why. That's why scientists and experts that study this thing say that we're all buried in it. Well, what might we miss? But we didn't have it for. I didn't have it for forty years of my life. I got by just fine. Um, I work on at my other job at Channel Three in a news capacity. We do a news show at five o'clock every day on Channel Three here in Cleveland, and we report on studies a lot. And as the media has, as the social medium has been in existence longer and longer and longer, more and more long-term studies are coming out. I have yet to see any study that has dove deeply into social media that correlates social media minutes used with happiness. Every study I've reported on upstairs and read about has had one common thread. The more you use, the, the less happy you are and the more instance of mental illness that starts to creep in. I don't need to do that to my, that's self-inflicted. That's a decision we all make. I'm going to do this. And I've decided not to. And when you're away and truly away, and I mean truly away, there is a liberation that comes with that, that you realize, gosh, when I'm in my day-to-day grind and I'm (laughs) just sort of skirting the surface of that world, it has an impact. It just does. So I, I do think there'll be a tipping point. We're not there yet maybe 10 years, we'll hit a tipping point where everyone realizes that this is a self-inflicted injury. It's like smoking. You make the decision to smoke. Yeah. You have to deal with the consequences physically that come along with that. I think with social media, it's you, you make a decision to live in that space, then you will ultimately realize that just like the Surgeon General warning on the pack of the cigarettes, it will, it, it will, it will come, social media will come with the same thing. Let me, let me Use it your own peril. Let me ask you this. Do you, you know, throughout your career, did you, did you find a need to, uh, because you do sports, right? And there's, I don't know why, like, 
if you were an accountant or a finance person, you wouldn't feel the need to know every single accounting fact or right. every single. Right. right. You feel like since you're a sports, you're supposed to know everything. Yeah. And did you find that like there was pressure to be like, okay, but I have to, I have to 1, watch this, percent. or I gotta know this, or I gotta read this, or One I'm thousand gonna look percent. crazy. Particularly the 16 years that I was working at ESPN. I knew, and because of the guys I worked with, I, I worked with Skip Bayless. Mm -hmm. I knew that on any given day, I could walk through the door. And when we started our ideas meeting, mm -hmm. Skip could say, we have got to talk about the Clippers and the Jazz last night. <laughs> you like, and I'm like, well, I was dead asleep. <laughs> My alarm goes off at 4 a.m. for this show. Yeah, like Skip doesn't sleep. And so if you weren't, now obviously I'm not staying up and watching those games like, like crazy Skip was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I would do was I would have to read deep synopsises on everything before I put foot in that meeting. Because if I didn't, it was there was a very strong likelihood that that would be the one event Skip wants to put a circle around and spend 15 minutes on. And then you're behind the eight ball because now you're closer to show. Yeah. Your show prep is window is shrinking and now you got to and then you're unprepared. So I wanted to be a professional. I wanted to be up on every possible thing. I never wanted to be surprised by anything he could say. So that mean that meant I had to consume what he consumed. And I've never met a human that consumes more either watching, reading or just discussion than Skip. No one, not even Stephen A. I remember seeing a speaking engagement with Deion Sanders, and he was speaking to, you can't pay attention to your critics because your right. critics have critics, and that when people say something negative about you, we have to understand that attention is something that you pay. And a so lot true. of the times, like so true. people say things that's harsh or disrespectful because they want your attention. And he was just speaking to, you know, control what you can, can control and yeah. understand that attention to something that's paid and if you don't pay that toll you won't even be bothered that's or so impacted true. by it so. i call i just I, my term is don't feed the cats yeah you know if you got a stray cat that comes out on your front porch and you ignore it it goes away if you have a stray cat that comes out on your front porch and you put a dish of milk out there he's going to be back tomorrow and he's going to be back the next day and now because you've created a habit it's going to become more and more difficult to get rid of him to, to if you i mean if you want him bring him into your home if that's your choice that's fine but be careful the doors you open because you might not want everybody to walk through that door. <laughs> Deion Sanders has it exactly right. Now, Deion's lived it at such an extreme level because he had unbelievable stardom from the time he was 20 years old mm -hmm. and lived with that for 18 years. And now he has stardom for a different reason. He had, if you think about it, he has, in, as a player, as a broadcaster, and as a coach, he has risen to the highest level. There are very few that have done all three. Yeah. He's done all three. True. That's true. And so for him, he's lived in that, that he had a, some interesting comments over the weekend when he talked about why he doesn't go to visit recruits. And really? And it was fascinating. I clicked on it because I think it was on CBSSports.com, if you guys want to read it. Or I, I could be wrong. It was on one of the websites that I look at regularly. And it said, Deion Sanders answers critics about not making in-home visits. And when I first saw it, I thought, wow, you know, that could be controversial. Yeah. The way he's, he goes, I'm not, I'm not recruiting high school kids anymore. The game's at the portal. He goes, I don't need to go to a 20-year-old man's house. Why do I need to go to a 20-year-old man's house? He's all, I, my yeah. view is, I want you to come to us. Right. I want you to come visit Colorado and see how we do it and see how we live. It was fascinating. It was fascinating because when I first clicked on it, I, I thought to myself, he could fall behind the game if he doesn't. And go into the homes, and he did, but he explained why he doesn't need to. And he's been, he told another thing, you know, very few people coach at a division one level. Like people don't go to like, he was at an HBCU. Well, what division. are there? 120 jobs, yeah, yeah, yeah. 122 jobs, whatever yeah. the number is. He jumps from HBCU to Colorado. And then when he gets to Colorado, his son is the quarterback in the star, right? So who, who, who coaches their star quarterback? Almost. At, I can't think of another instance. I, 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 I can think of co uh, coaches that had their kid on as a walk-on yeah, right. or as a third string, yeah. but Doug they McDermott. weren't. Who? Doug McDermott at Creighton. His father was the coach. Yeah. He was True. national player of the year. True. No, no, you're right. type of prospect. You're right. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. talking like – I just, I, for football, I can't think of another guy. Because the quarterback. It's the quarterback. It's the number two voice in the program. It, it, and so it's, he, it's amazing. He comes in, yeah, my son's starting. You don't even worry about that. <laughs> I know. Just lay down just, a lot. Just, I, I, 
and he talks different. So he he's done it at a yeah. He he you you can't be worried about it. I've even I even find myself early like sometimes I got a little more energy to it. Like you know, say I, sometimes I joke and say I might have some energy for you today, right? Yeah. But I find myself <laughs> so you engage. So I might. Find I used my, to engage. Yeah, like I engage from time to time. It, yeah. So you know, but you'll get to a point. I don't know when it is. It's different for everyone. You'll get to a point when you almost realize when here's my thing. I've talked about this before. I just need to know who I'm talking to. Right. I don't want to talk to high school star 27. <laughs> I, I don't need that. I don't have time for that. Yeah. Like I, I don't. I know everybody has an opinion and they're all entitled to it and that's fine. I just don't need to engage with you. Now, if you give me a real name and a real picture, I am far more likely or, to engage with Or if you have some civilized nuance. Right, if you come at it the right, that's the key. Like I said, you know, I ain't got a problem. We could talk. I love talking sports, but... I don't want to talk. Uh, he's trash. Yeah. But that is mean. Well, you that? know, your opinion is ass. You're an idiot. Like, okay. That's a great, you know, you, what's the saying? You catch more with, with uh, honey than vinegar? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, to me, that's just such a lack of decorum and class. Why would you engage with someone that comes at you like that? The other thing, too, is I always say, b- b- Comport yourself on social media as you would in a day-to-day interaction face-to-face. Yeah. Would you ever go up to somebody and say, man, your opinion is awful, no. and you, you're terrible at your job? <laughs> no, I wouldn't. You, it doesn't happen. <laughs> Why? Because there yeah. are social rules. But the thing is, on social media, when you're hiding behind the facade of the internet, you get those internet muscles, and you're feeling yourself. You, you, and you I want j- it. just, so, I just, I have no time for it. But anyhow, well, good, good I'm going to be back. back to answer your question. I used to I used to feel like I was missing out. I don't now. I know where to go to get information. Were you on a boat? Uh, I, we were supposed to be on a boat one day. The, the whole time we were there, all sun. It rained one day. Mm-hmm. We were going to go out on a boat Saturday, and the winds were like thirty mile an hour sustained. It was a beautiful day, but the the Gulf was churned and the winds were sustained. I got to so, go one day. I want to know what it's like to double park in the harbor. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Uh, fine. Four, five, five. In the and wind, I'll... let me tell you, it could be a real adventure. A real Speaking adventure. of Anyhow, adventures, it's great to see you guys Jay. again. What's that, Mike? Speaking of adventures, the Cavs game last night was absolutely an adventure. We're going to start with that today after a quick word from FanDuel. You can say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel is letting you bet on every single game of the NCAA tournament, whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed. It's time to go dancing on America's number one sportsbook. And right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if their first $5 bet wins. That's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. Just visit FanDuel.com slash UCSS and bet on college hoops until they cut the nets down. Our winning ticket today comes from our guy Cedric Lyons, who turned $1 into $322 ahead, on dog. a damn near 11-leg same-game parlay over two different games, $1 into $322. Hit all his over-unders. That's a hell of a win for Cedric Lyons. If you have a winning ticket, make sure you send it in to us at Twitter, email, and we will feature it on the show in the coming days. Has anybody been, been hitting big on the tournament or no? Uh, you know, I, I've been doing some. I, I told myself, you know, I won a couple hundred. I won about 100, 160. All right. I, that's light. I, I need to get where these. Listen, I'm I'm 22 parlay guy. You know, 20 or 20 or even with the even with the tournament. Now, because um, I'd be that would scare me because college basketball is so damn unpredictable. I, I won, but it was on money lines with, with some some. Uh, OK, with yeah, some, that's uh, the favorites. But right. but here's the thing. Um, Man, it's kind of crazy because when you bet in point spreads, you ain't seen these teams play. Oh. Point spreads and 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 plus minus is kind of tricky. I haven't seen them. What was the out? Was there any outrage that Ohio State missed the tournament? Not really, because it led to my boycotting really. the tournament. I basically said I don't need to see a dribble. And did, did nonsense. They, did they lose? They lost to Illinois and it, and it, and it on a con. Did you watch the Illinois Ohio State game? Yeah, they I mean, got jobbed no at the end of the game. I think you would admit that. Yeah. Most of the most of the people that know basketball looked at it and said, "Yeah, that game was taken from them." Illinois went on to waltz to the Big Ten championship. Yeah. The only time they were challenged really was Ohio State, and they're still playing in the Sweet Sixteen. Illinois right? is still alive, so I know the. I don't really like to play the could have won, mm-hmm. but <laughs> when, when it's the, when the outcome is that one call that comes down to the end of the game and it was flipped, and the, the outcome would have been flipped, then I'm okay with playing it. So. They had a better record than Michigan State. They beat Michigan State. They beat Purdue, a one seed. They didn't get in. 
They and weren't even one of the next four teams on the bubble. So I'm they sure they were, but you're going to tell me that the, you're going to tell me that these 13, 14, 15, 16s that were getting that largest from weaker conferences are better than Ohio State. The other thing that I had a big problem with, and I'm not a Big East fan, I'm not, but I did watch enough of the Big East this year to realize that there is something going on there. There is a they it, haven't lost. They're 12 and 0. I know they are, and here they come, and the fact that. Patino didn't get in at St. John's. I didn't understand that. I really didn't. I, I thought he, he did enough to get a, a bid. So I just think the tournament has become so damn polit- I hate when people are sitting in a room saying, this is the best team, that's the best team. The reason is, we get it wrong more than we get it right as humans, mm-hmm. because if we didn't, they wouldn't be building casinos out of billion-dollar marble. Well, that's big facts. Hey, when Fanner, John Fanner was on about a week ago. And uh, I think the, the crazy part about it, me and Earl was doing a radio show on Saturday. Biggest story right now is Caitlin Clark. It's crazy. She's nuts. Like, like, it's like people, like I'm watching these tournament <laughs> games. These women tournament games is packed out. Like, it's crazy. Like, the like the buzz is like, hey, we just got to get Caitlin Clark in Cleveland. They got to keep it. winning. That's it. Everybody is just like. It'll be a <laughs> crippling blow to Cleveland. <laughs> If Iowa doesn't make it to the final four, they We're just want that rippling. Ball. I think John Fanta alluded to the point that, you know, if Iowa makes it to the final four and Caitlin Clark is there, you know, as far as sports go and viewership in this town, they'll be second behind the Browns for the entire 2024. That wow. it will have more viewership than the Cavaliers or the Guardians. That's big, big talk right there. Jay, right. I appreciate your best efforts to the Lake Cavs talk as long as humanly yeah. possible. That was great. And that was a hell of an that effort. That was great. I liked it. You, you fell arrested for but 17 minutes. The clock never minutes. stops. That's why you 17 Crawford. minutes, but we do have to talk about last night's why debacle in South Beach. By far their worst loss of the season. Oh. It was the return of Evan Mobley, and even with him back in the lineup, there's not a single positive to take from that game. No. Watching it, G, I'll let you start here. Wait, for, for G went off, didn't he? G went off at like 4 a.m. <laughs> yeah, like, like, I, it's like, you know, I, I was in the group chat too. Like, yo, I, it was just nasty work. It was just. <laughs> what was it, a 40-point loss? They was 37 by, was time, the they final was, deficit. They was down by almost 50. Like, and it was literally a 50-piece <laughs> nugget. Like, I can't. Like, for me, it's just, it's, it's tough because I think that, you know, and I hate to keep going back to this, but we've seen championship organizations and one of the reasons why people a lot of times say you know lebron held us hostage or lebron wouldn't do this or lebron was being cryptic or no what lebron was doing is holding you accountable it's a lot of pressure playing with lebron because he always wants you to make a move he don't he's the first one in He's the last one out. He's the most conditioned. He's getting shots up. He keeps, he's taking care of his body. He's going to say, hey, hey, listen. Hey, listen, we're going to get some conditioning in. We, we all on the Versa climbers. We all getting it in. And so what he does is he puts pressure on you to always be trying to live up to a, to a championship legacy and standard. And I know it's hard. I get it. It is very difficult as a player to every single day give the effort, the attention to detail, and to, to pay the price daily in order to be a champion. Everybody say they want to be a champion, but there's only realistically about 15, 10 to 15% of the people that's putting in that work at the top down from the top of the organization to the bottom. Is your owner willing to spend? Is he willing to go to the luxury tax? Do you have a coach that's willing to make people uncomfortable and, and, and willing to be able to innovate and do things? Do you have a superstar that is going to hold everybody accountable? Do you have a secondary or third guy that understands I got to compromise, I got to give something to, to win a championship? And everybody say they want say they want to go to heaven, but don't nobody want to die. <laughs> so or live right or live right right like oh I, I had my 20 years here I, I know I was a jerk for 45 years but hey let, let me get in the gates real quick that ain't the way it worked <laughs> and when I'm watching the Cavs they have Earl they haven't paid the they haven't paid the price <laughs> the coach has not paid the price and said look at some point in time I gotta go from these guys liking me to these guys understanding that I'm driving them to do certain things the play in terms of what is your identity? Do you have a set way of playing that everybody, man, one through 10 understands? Do you have the buy-in? Are you willing to get in their face? Are you willing to take minutes away? All these things. But when I hear the most disappointing part is I hear him and I hear him say, 
Well, you know, it's just one of those things where, you know, guys are out and, you know, these guys are, are you know, this is a typical of them. This is what they usually put out. It was just one of those games. When you start saying that, when you start implementing that, it gives people the opportunity to always fall back on the easy way out. And the easy way out is saying that you're injured. And the easy way out is saying that you're going to get it better. And the easy way out is making excuses and saying Donovan Mitchell, and when we get back, he'll be. No, because you weren't, you weren't doing what you were supposed to when everybody was there. So my thing is, I just, to me, they have not set up a championship organization as far as their mindset. And it's very evident to say, see that be, in the way that the Heat play and the way we play. And I can tell you this, man. Last night was a horrible ass loss. I know this. Is it the worst of the season? Do you think? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, like, there's, there's so no too. excuses to that. To me, this team looked disinterested. They looked disengaged. They didn't come out playing with any energy at all. And anytime all those are factors, that falls directly on the shoulders of the head coach of this team. As the head coach, it's your job to make sure that your team is prepared to play, that they're focused, and that they come out and that they actually show an interest of being a part of the basketball game. To me, JG, it looked like they quit yesterday. You know, the Cavs have now lost, what, three in a row. They're losers of four of their last five, and they're three and seven in their last 10 games. They've you, won seven in their last 18. It's ridiculous. Here we are with 13 or less games to go in a regular, regular season, and you have the Cavaliers playing the way that they're playing. Meanwhile, you have teams that has a pretty good head coach like Eric Spoelstra, they're starting to ramp it up. They're starting sure. to get their stuff together. They're looking at the calendar. They're, start, they're starting to tighten up as, they're, as the regular season close, and we're entering the playoffs. And this is a team that's just, quite frankly, going in the wrong direction at the absolute wrong time. I think the biggest thing for me is uh, I'm with you on the JB thing, and here's why. We have seen so many different variations of this Cavaliers team mm -hmm. that, to me, it's as plain as writing on a wall what the best Cavalier, what the best version of the Cavaliers team is. Mm -hmm. Now, last night, I'm going to give them a little bit of pass because the Donovan Mitchell thing. Donovan Mitchell is clearly the son of the Cavaliers universe. It all goes around him. But what bothers me the most is that organizations are supposed to be able to watch in real time and assess situations that fans and media do. Mm -hmm. After January 1st, the Cavaliers were 17 and one. They went on to win and lose the next two. So they were 18 and two. Okay. So that is a quarter of the season. And there was something different about that quarter of the season than any other part of the year. They were without Mobley and Garland. And when you watched them play, we all agreed. This is the best that the Cavaliers have ever looked for a 20 game stretch in the non-LeBron James era. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you do the math, they set records and broke records that LeBron's teams had set. Thanks. And now everybody wants to say, well, weak schedule. Look who they're losing to now. <laughs> Get team. They're losing to teams that they were beating that everybody said was a weak schedule before. Or teams without their stars. Teams without sure. Jalen Brunson. Team Miami Miami is, is, is missing, um, what's his name? Uh, 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 they didn't have Tyler Hero or Duncan Robinson. And they're, what, time. they're about 10 games over 500 team? 8 to 10 games over 500? Here's yeah, they, the they don't take the regular season seriously. I know they don't. They've, yeah. they've kind of figured it out. Here's a sad reality, guys. The Cavaliers are currently three and a half games from being in a play-in situation. Yeah. Yeah. A play-in situation. That got on us real quick. And here's the other thing to that. Mitchell's going to be out how many more games? He gets reevaluated tomorrow. Yeah. There does not mean he's coming back Thursday. Sure. It doesn't mean Wednesday. They're going to reevaluate. He's still dealing with the broken nose. He's still dealing with the knee issues. I suggested letting him rest another two weeks because you need him to be 100% healthy for the playoffs or you have no chance whatsoever regardless even, of what seed. Even considering the fact that they're three and a half games from being in a play-in situation. They have a better chance coming out through the play-in with 100% Donovan Mitchell than being a five or six seed or even a three seed with 70 Here's the Donovan problem. I, I would agree with that statement on its surface. Here's what scares me to death. The Cavs end up slipping to the five and the Knicks end up in the four. Yeah. That's an L hole. I mean, that is a, a flat L. Last year it was the other way around. The Cavs were the four, the Knicks were the five. So to my original point, and then I'll let you go. We've watched different pieces and parts of this team. Mm -hmm. And the Cavaliers weren't just winning when they were going 18 and two. They were boat racing teams by 30. 
Let's put, let's put it on cap. They had the biggest point differential for a 20-game stretch in modern NBA history. Yeah, it's top five since the, since the 1970 season. So the last <laughs> I mean, 53 seasons. Think about that. And, think about So this isn't just the best version of a Cavaliers team. This, by some statistic measures, was one of the best stretches of basketball that NBA teams have played in the last 50 years. Yeah. And here's what's happened. And I, I said it at the time. You guys knew I was going to come back to this. It was crazy when I said it. A lot of people still think it's crazy today. All I said was, and this was before the trade deadline, it's not hard to figure out which Cavalier team, which pieces and parts works the best. Mm-hmm. Oh. I said Mobley and Garland or one or the other should be moved for parts. Now, I understand the Garland contract is, is difficult. It's cumbersome. And it's a problem. But this much I know, if I put the three players in vacuums by themselves, I can picture a Donovan Mitchell-led team winning a championship. I could too. I cannot picture an Evan Mobley-led team winning a championship, and I cannot picture a Darius Garland-led team winning a championship. Well, here's the thing. The Cavs are what? 10 and 12 this year when Donovan Mitchell doesn't play. Exactly. So it's safe to say for all of us. This, he's the guy. He, he's the guy. I don't think any of us on this panel trust the Cavaliers without a healthy Donovan. Oh, Mitchell without, Don, without him, all. They're, they're just a middling you know, team. Th- this is where I'm starting to become confused because I've said on this panel and I've said some things about Darius Garland that I've gotten backlash for. And I, I, I don't stand, know why he's so untouchable. But, but this, is the, this is what I stand on. He is showing me that he's consistently inconsistent. This dude, the last three games, right, has shot 27.3% from three-point range, 6-22, including, including 0-6, two games ago, and one to four last night. Now, over the last 10 games, he's averaging 19.6 assists. It's not bad, but it's not good enough for a max player or a player with his potential. So here's where I'm starting to become confused because I've said some things about Darius Garland. I've said some things about Evan Mobley when it comes to their consistency, right? I don't know if it's them or if we have a head coach and a coaching staff that's not developing these guys and, uh, is, and is not getting the most out of these two players. I don't know the particular. answer to that either. And so it's, it's really hard to say because a lot of fans, they can see Darius Garland's potential even through the BS that's going on right now. And so now I'm starting to question, okay, is it Darius Garland? Is it Evan Mobley? Or is it J.B. Bickerstaff and, and his coaching staff that's not being able to well, develop let, let these young you talented players? Let me ask you this question because I've come to the conclusion – that Darius Garland is so similar to the player that Donovan Mitchell is, Mm -hmm. clearly not as good. And by the way, it it makes it sound like I think Darius Garland's trash. I don't. I just don't think he's right for this team right now. So here's what I would ask you. Would you agree with this fact that Garland is a lesser version of Donovan Mitchell with a very similar skill set? Not as athletic or explosive, but they do a lot of the same things. They're handling handling the ball a lot. They're shooters. I think Evan Mobley and Jared Allen are also the same thing. I yep. think they're interchangeable. Right. To me, if you have, if you're playing poker and you have too many of one card, it can be a bad thing if you're going for a royal flush. Mm-hmm. It can be a great thing if you're going for a four of a kind. But if you end up with a three of a kind, you're not winning much with a three of a kind. No. And I think that's the analogy I would use here. They've got a lot of similar parts in their hand. What I want is a complete hand. I want the Royal Flush. So at the, before the deadline, I, I, my, my suggestion was you go to Donovan Mitchell and say, we're all in on you. We want you to sign an extension. If we can get you to agree to an extension, we're going to make some moves that are going to strengthen your opportunity to win a championship in this city. Mm-hmm. And that means dealing some key parts. But... Yep, yep. Yep. What if that conversation yep. happened and it didn't become public? Then at least the Cavs did their due diligence. I don't think it ever happened. I think that they are stubbornly holding on to Mobley and Garland, thinking that they're, that will be their ace in the hole if Garland walks out of town. And, or, I mean, excuse me, if Mitchell walks out of town. But if Mitchell walks out of town, it doesn't matter. This team is not winning a championship at, at all. At zero. I, I look at Darius Gar, and, and we just got to be clear. Just, just be, we've seen championship teams before. 
Sometimes you can fool yourself into thinking just because it's the best you've had in a couple years that that means it's going to be good enough to get it done. No, it's just not. It's not. When I go back and watch, remember when the Cavs played the Warriors? Do you remember how hard they had to claw and oh fight for every inch? Like it took a game where where LeBron and Kyrie on the road had forty. You see, let, let, let's not let's not let's not fool ourselves here. Darius Garland is not getting forty against the, on the road in a game in a, in, a, in a seven game series against one of the best teams of all time. That's what it takes sometimes. Sometimes it takes Channing Fry hitting like nine or ten threes in a game against Toronto. And, and, and then go back and look at look at the teams that the Cavs used to play. Right, the Raptors. Really good team. Kyle Lowry, DeMar DeRozan. Those battles. A, a Boston. 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 A times. They, remember how they used to just come up short against the Cavs and they couldn't do nothing with us on certain and certain times because LeBron was just like, no, we're going to make sure we get a stop. We're going to make sure we hit a shot. Or Kyrie says, no, I got it this time. Or Kevin Love hits timely three-point shots. We watching a team right now that is that is losing to teams without their best players. And, 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 and how Ty Lu used to say, look, hey, Kev, I love you to death, but you got to come off the bench. Right. That's Kevin. At the time, it was Kevin Love. Like, that's big time Kevin Love. He said, I love you. Got to come off the bench. They won't even do that to Evan Mobley, who ain't proved nothing. He get 15 points a game. He would have had to come off the bench or something, especially you got two pieces. That's the same, Jay. They won't even that's do that. That's bothering me. I mean, they've got a lot of the same when they could have role players. Because we know to win a championship, you've got to have every role filled. Not with good players, not even with above average players. They've got to be elite. And all these role players have to be elite players. I think in this particular instance, Garland would make a great off-the-bench replacement to Mitchell when Mitchell gets his breathers. I do not want him in the game at the end. Guys, he's a liability (laughs) at the end of the game. And I've been saying that with turnovers. (laughs) One game, he didn't even get off a shot. Uh, It's just, I don't know what happens, but sometimes... When the he shot the ball nine times last night, and that's I, that almost he had seems, nine points, bro. Well, he got benched in the third quarter, never came back in. Deservedly, and so. deservedly, they benched all the starters. You have there. points you want to make. What are they? Yeah, I just, well, just want to say this. I actually think, in a weird roundabout way, that eighteen and two stretch was the worst thing that ever happened to the Cavs this season. Hmm. And one thing we forget in that stretch is both Mobley and Garland went eight and one in that stretch. That wasn't totally without them, right? And that 18-2 and two stretch raised expectations and an idea that this style of play was sustainable, which in some respects it is, <laughs> but it was sustainable because Donovan Mitchell was playing the best basketball of his eight-year career, and Jared Allen also But don't you ever ask the, the question why? Well, I'm getting at that. There is some things about the schedule that certainly helped. There are some things about coaching decisions that fell into JB's lap. Sam Merrill was an unknown. He was un- on fire from three, unstoppable. George Niang, Isaac Okor was shooting his best stretch. They fell into that. 18-2, and two, you take that out of their, their record, they're a 500 team. They're exactly 25-25 they and 25 without that 20-game stretch. I think that 18-2 and two stretch raised expectations to a point where we thought this team was probably better and had a higher ceiling than it ever realistically had. I know, but— And now trying to come back and look at, okay, why can't they reach that ceiling again? Well, obviously Mitchell's hurt, so that takes a huge chunk out of it. But it was unrealistic to ever think that Donovan and Jared could play at that level. But let me for a ask you a period. question, Mike. And real, real quick, before you ask the question, Darius has not been good enough. Like, point blank period. No. He has not been good enough. Mobley, we expected to take a massive step in year three. He's gotten a little better. But he Marginally. hasn't taken that massive step that we'd expected. No. And the two-big lineup doesn't work. Like We've it, seen At it. the end of the day, it doesn't work. It does not there work. There are other reasons to why they have looked so poor in the second half other than just injuries. Because every team in the NBA deals with injuries. They're not the only they do. team. And You're every right. team's in a weird 14, 15 game stretch where they're not getting rest days and they're playing back right. to backs. And by the way, the Cavs' first back to back in two weeks is tonight. They're home Come against Charlotte. So we can't even use they're playing four or five back to backs. No. But the reality of that 18 game stretch was Donovan Mitchell was playing the best basketball of his entire but Mike, career. Mike, I, I get that. You're right. And I don't, I don't deny that at all. But I, I, I always want to know well, why? Well, what? Like when a hitter's got a 26-game hitting streak, I want to know what's going on, well, what's happening. What's different? Now, I understand sometimes the ball looks like a beach ball. Sometimes it looks like a BB. I think the whole team was that. seen as a beach ball. The whole, the whole team was right, making but an here's, un- here's my point. unrealistic amount of threes. That's sometimes, that was the outlier. Sometimes, like in baseball, a guy's hitting 260 in the five spot. 
and the manager makes a crazy decision to put him in the two spot, okay? Because everything in baseball feeds off what happens before you in a batting lineup. Yeah, you need people on base. Yeah, right. you need people That's on base. You can take pressure off position. a guy by dropping him down in the lineup. Absolutely. You can also help a guy by putting him in front of a guy that gets on base a lot. Mm-hmm. He's going to see more strikes. If it's a guy that dives at pitches that are out of the zone, He's going to benefit by having a guy in front of him that's on base a lot. The pitcher doesn't have the luxury of walking him. He's going to see strikes. So what I'm saying is I've seen instances in baseball where you've taken a 260 hitter in the five spot and you irrationally throw him in the two and he hits 330. Well, in the grand scheme of things, 270 and 330 is a massive jump in baseball, right? Massive. Yes. You're like, oh my God, a 270 hitter? I don't think much of him. A 330 hitter is an all-star and maybe a Hall of Famer if he can do that for 15 years. But if you think about it, it's only six percentage points. 60 on the 1,000 scale. So imagine if a shooter is shooting 27% and then shooting 33%. That's Sam Merrill. That's Sam Merrill. Now, why? Maybe it's because the players he's sharing the floor with. It impacts every touch in a basketball game. One of the stats that our boy Fanta said that knocked me off my seat, and I can't remember the exact numbers now. Jared Allen got 40 touches more per game. Per game! Yeah, which, which is, by the way, the two, the two big lineup. I, I don't, it can't work. In it front can't of work. We've seen and, that. And, and I'm not arguing that. But I'm they haven't saying, come to that conclusion yet, Mike. They keep no, doing it. Uh, and that, what, what's astonishing I'm not to me. JB here. Like, trust me, this is not a defensive JB. I, just, I understand, but there's also other people in the organization, stretch. Mike, that can look at that, Kobe, <clears throat> yeah. and say, this isn't working. But, but Kobe yeah, decided 40 to 40 more touches per game. That's, that's one of the most astonishing stats I have ever heard. He was basically the invisible man when he was playing with, with Mobley. And then Mobley goes out and he gets 40 more touches per game, and the whole thing explodes, 18-2. and two. He played the best stretch of Jared Allen's so, entire career in that 20 years. No question. So my thing is, sometimes in baseball, you're looking at the player. This is the same guy that was hitting in the five hole. I'm, I'm, hitting 270. Now he's hitting 330. Why? We moved him in the lineup. So little tweaks like that, every single possession and every player on the floor are either benefit factors or they're victims of the players around them. And what we learned was, by accident, was that's the Rubik's Cube and, formula. And, that's and, it. And you look at it and you, you you put that in context with, you know, those bigs not really working with each other. And then you take in contrast and, and compare uh, Donovan Mitchell with Darius Garland. They are similar pair, players, but more uh, when you look at Donovan Mitchell, he's much more sudden when he makes a decision. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, it's, I, it's, I mentioned it, the explosiveness. He, 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 he He's either going to go to the rack, and if he if he's going, he's going to go with with, with intention of finishing, or he's going to kick because guys and there's got no clapped. pause, and there's no and yeah. guy, and then when guys get it, they can swing. You get the hockey assist, and now all of a sudden the ball's moving. They also push the pace a lot more with Donovan Mitchell. Look out to get to get out and open and transition. And the thing with Darius Garland is, it may not seem like it, but you you know McNuggets when you're doing one on one drills, what do they tell you? When you doing when you doing continuous one on one, you get three dribbles to get a shot. If you right. ain't got, if it take you more than three dribbles to get a shot, find, that someone it, else. find somebody else. The ball got to move. Kick it, yeah. Darius Garland. It doesn't seem like a lot, but those extra two to three seconds in the paint where you're dribbling and probing, that stagnates everything. Now, when you try to swing and kick, it's a difference between somebody like Sam Merrill being wide open or Sam Merrill with somebody in his face. Isaac Okoro being open the corner, wide open. And that's open. how everybody plays better. And that's how people look, get, get better. And, and I don't know why JB is not. And another thing, too, this is crazy. The variation of his Darius Garland's game is different. My dad called me. He said, hey, remember, remember when Darius Garland used to have that little floater in the lane? What happened to that? He's scared of contact right now. I, why? He ain't even see. That floater. I've been saying this for a while. Who Ain't knows? He lost 10 pounds when he broke his jaw earlier. Right. I just think he's scared of getting hit in the paint. Too frail. Getting hurt again. Right. Yeah. I mean, that, that's just my opinion. I have no that, idea. That I think that's a very well that floater, opinion. That floater, is, that it, it keeps people honest. You don't know if it's a lob to Allen. You don't know if he's going he, to. You, you give yourself a whole other option, and that was a big part of his game. And I said, and, you know what, And, Dad? G, if he's not getting to the paint, he's relying on his three-point shot. 
and he's an undersized point guard going yep. against lanky defenders, especially without Donovan on the court because they're best primary perimeter defenders guarding Darius, which then leads to bad three-point shots. He gets frustrated. It's a whole spiral, which all comes back to this, and Earl, you chime in. Without Donovan, this team has no chance. I which think, is, I think which is why me, I, I'm willing to let zero. him rest until he's 100%. I think for me, I go back to the first time we played Minnesota. I think it was the game that we played Minnesota here at Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse. I thought that was Darius Garland's overall best game this season. The way that he asserted himself. Is that himself, the game that won overtime? I think so. Yes. The game that yeah, you know what? I agree with that. But at the end of the game, he had a chance to win it and didn't get a shot off. But to me, this is why I feel like that. He, he asserted himself as, the, as a dominant on-ball guard, right? He, he was facilitating. Right. But not only that, he seemed like he was making the right decision every single time. Or he was actually getting to the paint. And then when he was getting to the paint, he was making quick decisions on, you know, should I lob this up to Jared Allen? Should I use the floater? He was pulling Rudy Gobert out and making him confused on what it was he was doing. You seen the confidence in his own ability put on full display in that one game. And then, like, he gets back to being inconsistent Darius Garland right. over and over. And so, to me, it doesn't always show up in a box score. It's not always about the stats. It's about how he looks when he's out there on that court with his decision-making, his own confidence in his own game, et cetera. And I just think the dude needs to become more consistent than what he's been. We got 13 games left. I don't know if he's going to get it together or not before the playoffs start. I just know this team needs Donovan Mitchell back fast. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. Because I don't think they have a chance without him. Um, Long-term, I think this year – I, I have them, if, the, if Mitchell comes back, they're going to win one series at most. They will not advance to the finals. Not a chance. Uh, at least if they continue thinking that they can get by with two bigs and Garland and Mitchell on the floor for most of the minutes together. Um, I think they, at best, win one series. And right now, the way they're playing, um, and depending on their first series matchup and where they slot, I, we could have the exact same performance as last year, one and done. Yeah, it could be tough. Right now, they'd play Indiana in the 3-6 matchup, but like we alluded to before, they are just half a game up above New York for the four spot and literally four and a half games ahead of a playing spot. So there's a lot to sort out. I thought it was three and a half. Aren't they 14 and a half out and 17 out is the playing spot? I, I was looking at where they were, yeah. I guess technically three and a half, but it's... I mean, can you imagine that? I, it's, guys, it's four games. Here's there. the other thing, too, that, that t- tells me that there's a major ceiling on where they can go this year. To me, I always ask the question, what is this team? What, is, what, what are the Browns during their season? Right. What are the Cavs this year? And to, to answer that question, you have to first ask two other questions. What is their ceiling? Yeah. And what is their floor? And for the teams that win the championship, it's usually a space like this. Yeah. For the Bostons, for the LeBron-led teams when he was here, they were either going to win it or they were going to lose in the conference finals. Yeah. And that was the floor and that was the ceiling. But for this team, consider this. We have mentioned JB as a coach of the year, <laughs> and we have also said at times, he's got to go. So that floor and ceiling is like this. And then when you look at the Cavs, 17-1, and 7-11. and 11. And, the, it, and it'd be one thing if during the 17-1 and one they had no injuries. They had two of their top three or four players out, 17-1. and one. That's their ceiling, 18-2. and two. That's how good they could be. Over the last 18 games, some of which Donovan Mitchell has played, they're 7-11. and 11. So their floor and ceiling is like this. So I say that their ceiling could be, if they figure it out like the 18-1, and one, an NBA championship. And but their floor could also be getting bounced in the first round of the playoffs. We, we also, and you can't win it that way. Absolutely. We, you know, I, I look at it like this a little bit, man. Again, Jared Allen was somebody they traded for. Donovan Mitchell was somebody they traded for. Karis LeVert, somebody they traded for. Again, most of the Cavs' best players are guys that they've traded for. And the guys that they have chosen, Darius Garland and, uh, and uh, Evan Isaac Mo- Okoro. Isaac Okoro, these are lottery picks. And, and if you want to win a championship, your lottery picks have to turn into top 10 guys. Like, you know, uh, it, you know, look at Pablo um, Bancaro, right? It, it, it's, Bancaro is better than, than Mobley, right? No, it's not even a question. Yeah. yeah. 
and, and they just drafted him a couple years ago, right? You you, you get guys draft after Mobley, right? So I mean, you, you can't. Yeah, you're him. right. You got to develop. You got to draft well. <laughs> you've got to develop well, and you have to fill in the blanks with free agency and trades. It's, it's just funny, man. You know, we're at the end of this regular season, and I go back to uh, last off season. You know, and we thought that we will see some significant changes with the Cavaliers. But if you think about it, they really ran it back with the same core, the same core for the same head coach. Yep. Yep. And they were expecting a different result. I think Jay, I think uh, Kobe Altman looked at this thing like if I keep everything in place and add, some pieces, and add some pieces around it, 51. that this team will be better next year with just another year of growth and maturity. Yeah. We heard Jason Lloyd speak to that point all the time. And I think we're realizing as we close this season out that we're trying to fit a square into a round circle, right? Right. The pieces that we have, as much as we want everything to mesh and to fit together, meaning from the head coach and to the players that we consider the core for this team, the reality is it just don't. And until we make a move, uh, we're going to be in this same situation year in and year out. Yeah, I'm afraid you're right. All right, Mike. Uh, we're going to talk a little Guardians now here. If you want to go to a Guardians game this season, there's no better place to buy your tickets than the Game Time app. You should never have to worry about when you buy your tickets for your next big sporting events because Game Time is the fastest and easiest way to buy tickets online with killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and their best price guarantee. Game Time takes all the guesswork out of buying tickets, their lowest price guarantee, and event cancellation protection. Make sure you're getting the best deal possible as well. Just download the Game Time app, create an account, and use promo code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Once again, create an account, redeem promo code Locked On for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. We have Tom Hamilton joining the show at twelve thirty to talk a little Guardians. We'll spend ten minutes here about their opening day roster. Jay, the Guardians made it official over the weekend. Naming their 26-man roster, Miles Straw was optioned to AAA. He cleared waivers and will start the season in Columbus. What are your overall thoughts on the Guardians' 2024 opening day roster? I, I like Miles um, personally as a guy. I think he's a great guy. Um, he just Now, he did do some work on his body in the offseason, and the first thing I noticed when he walked into our interview room in Arizona was, damn, this dude has put in the work. Like, he physically... He's rebuilt his frame. He's added 10 pounds of muscle. It's, it's, he, he looked much better. Um, but I think the Guardians, there is a clear and obvious shift in philosophy going on with the Guardians organization right now. They thought, in defiance of conventional wisdom, that they could small ball their way to a World Series. Uh, they came damn close couple of years ago they had the fewest strikeouts they didn't hit for power they were 26th or 7th in the league in home runs they stole a lot of bases then last year something really odd happened not only did their home run output go down to dead last in the league by a lot but their base running production went way down just stop stealing bases. And I, I didn't understand that like you, you got to have one or the other you you've got to have one or the other. And Miles Straw could provide the base running. But for some reason, they weren't running nearly as aggressively on the bases as they did in 2022. And I could, I never did figure it out. I can't understand it to this day. I don't know why they suddenly stopped running. When the trend in the league was for everybody to run more. Remember the bigger bases? Yep. Made it a little bit easier to steal the base. The percentage of stolen Pitch bases clock. went way up. Their production went way down. Um, so it, to me, the writing on the wall was on the wall in the clubhouse when straw arrived even though he had put in the work and he looked different he didn't hit any home runs last year their outfield had i think one of the most historically low home run outputs in the history of the game of the live ball era for a major league outfield they just didn't hit home runs i think vote came in now i don't know if he's the guy driving the ship on this i have to think he is because he's the only guy that changed mm -hmm. the gm is the same all the major pieces are the same but and nobody really came out and embraced it as much as Will Brennan did. Will Brennan, we've had him on this show a number of times. I love Will. And I'm glad to see that he right now is penned in as the opening day starter in right field. He didn't hide from it at all. I asked him, is there, has, is there a vocalized shift in philosophy in the organization? And he's like, 
Oh, yeah. Like, so he said the quiet part out loud. Maybe teams don't like to, you know, telegraph that stuff, but he had no problem with it. He said, yeah, we've talked about it. We've, look, look what's going on in baseball. We've got to hit more home runs. So what that means is you're not looking at every swing as gold currency. Like, that's what they were doing before. I've got to put bat on ball. I can't swing and miss. Well, when you take the swing and miss idea out, I know myself as a player all through my career. When I went up to the plate with the idea that I'm taking hacks, I was most productive in the power game. And that's what they have to do. And, remember, and I think they've done that. So for Straw, he doesn't fit in with where they're going. And, and you know, Jay, listen, I, I think Will, he said himself when we aired that that uh, interview that you did, he said, listen, I got to go up there. It's a, di- it's a different day. I got to get my cuts in. I, it, it's You got to be able to hit the long ball. And, and remember last year, it, it was even a thing. If you went up there and you was in, in the Guardians organization and you went up there swinging at first pitches, if you didn't go deep in the count, you might be sitting next to Tito. That's exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> if you didn't go deep in that count, they looking at you like, hey, yep. how many cuts did you get up there? Like, uh, We need you to, we need to see some pitches here. Right. And that's their mentality. And gee, you can still have that mentality, by the way. You can still be judicious at the plate and have great pitch discipline and spit on pitches that are on the on the edges. On the, on, on the fringes. But when you get late in the count, you can't do that. No. You've got to swing and you've got to swing away. I make a prediction right now. The Guardians will hit 30 to 40 more home runs this year than they did last year. They will strike out probably 10% to 20% more. I'm okay with that. That's, fine. That's where the game is played today. That's fine. So for me... I've, I've heard a few of Stephen Vogt's interviews. And the thing that I always... You like think, him? I do like him. And, and I, like, I like his approach to the game. I love him. One, I think the fact that he just pretty much got finished playing baseball, I think it helps. Um, no matter what the sport is, I am really into these managers and head coaches that's former players and not too far removed from the game. Young. But one of the touch. things... Right. One of the things he talked about was putting more emphasis on the long ball, putting more emphasis on being a team that can hit home runs, right? He talked about having this team uh, going against what they did again with Tito deeper into the counts, but taking, taking more uh, hacks at the first pitch earlier in the count, being more, more aggressive earlier in the count. Sometimes that's the best pitch you're going to see. I don't know much about, about a lot of these young prospects, but the Chase, the, the louder guy, right. he's a center fielder with power. And this is why I, I was scratching my head. If he's a center fielder with power, and we all know that we lacked power from all the outfielders combined last year, and then every time you as the manager get in front of the media and you speak too well, it's about you know having more power, more emphasis on the long ball and being more aggressive, then why is it that one of your top prospects who's a power hitter is not on your opening day lineup. Now, right. Will has tried to educate me a little bit. About, he'll, be, he'll be here. There's some service time rules that, June 1st. that, that, that you know, plays a part into why Which they I hate, make certain the decisions that they make. But, I mean, I don't really know what to expect outside of the guys I do know, Jose Ramirez and, and Josh Naylor and Steven Kwan. I got some young guys I'm a fan of, Gabriel Arias, Bo Naylor, that's my boy. You know, hopefully those two dudes can live up to their potential and then we get some younger prospects in here that can um that can help out but i want to see this team hit more home runs i think that if you start hitting more home runs of course like the fans are excited this team is more exciting to watch you'll you'll have more people going to the games the pitching is going to do what the pitching always does yeah i'm not really worried about they've got to stay healthy you know but i am really interested to see on how this team uh responds to their new fresher younger uh, 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 manager versus than what we seen last year. Well, yeah, I am too. You know, Jay, like there's a certain thing to be said for, um, right. You want to see you, 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 you want to see uh, Manzardo. You want to see guys like that. You want to see Delauder. But there is a certain thing to be said for guys that they they need to take a look at as well. Like sure. there's some guys that may be in the pecking order. They need to make a decision on. Right. I need to let me like Rocchio. I I didn't know. Like, I'm like okay. I was c- kind of surprised he made the the, the roster. You got to take a look at some of these guys in order to figure out. And if they're not the guys, if they don't have any options left for it, they're not going to the minors. You can move them aside and bring somebody up. Um, for me, I'm glad that Stephen Vogt made a, a move with, uh, with with 
uh, straw in, in center field because it signifies that it's a new philosophy. And there's a lot of times when you're a new manager, you could, you could come in and just be like, I'm going to do status quo for a little bit just so I don't ruffle no feathers, right. keep everything cool, and then I'll, I'll start with my program mid through, way through the season. I like the fact that they say, no, nah, we're going to get Freeman out there. We're going to get a lot of these guys, and we're going to take a look at them, and I'm going to base them on the merit that I'm looking at them. So now you got a position in center field where we're going to give you a shot if you don't do something. Next man up. That's right. Next man up. I like it. Yeah, I, I would, I'm with you. I applaud votes. Uh, I don't want to say courage, but his aggressiveness. Mm-hmm. To come in here to a team that I, last year, let's face it, they woefully underperformed. It was largely due to the fact that the pitching staff was decimated with injuries. They finished below 500. That's not a characteristic of a Tito Francona led team. They finished below the Detroit Tigers. At the end of the year, the Tigers surged, got hot, and passed them. Guardians were third last year. But you look back to the core of the team is essentially very similar to what it was in 22 when they made a nice little playoff run. Mm-hmm. So I think for me, I was, I was afraid that Vogt was going to come in and say, let's play at status quo, let's keep Straw in center, let's keep Arias at short, and let's see. He came in and said, no, no, not that's cool. not good enough. This team needs poked. So they took two starters. It's my understanding that Straw, who accepted the assignment, by the way, to, to Columbus, the AAA team, so he's not in the mix, but Arias will not be the opening day starting shortstop. That's crazy. Now, to me, that is... That's a titanic shift for this organization because he's been mentioned going back to, you know, after Lindor, well, yep. he's, gonna, he's next, he's coming, he's in the pipeline. And last year when they made the trade to the Dodgers to clear the shortstop position for him, they, they gave him every opportunity yep. to prove that this job is his. And he hit about 198 or 200 or whatever right. he hit. He shows flashes of still being a very good player. But you know what I said about the Cavs and how you evaluate a team? I do the same thing when I evaluate a player. What's their floor? What's their ceiling? Mm -hmm. And I think his floor is down here and his ceiling's up here. That's too big of an area. You're going to get too much inconsistency. I need a guy whose ceiling is here and his floor is here. They're close. So you you can put him in at everyday shortstop and know that he's going to hit at least 270. He's going to steal some bases. He's going to flash a lot of leather. And from time to time, he'll run into one and give you a long ball. But I I think that what, what what they're saying is we've seen you. And we've seen straw. The sample size is big enough. We know who you are. We don't know who Rokio is going to be every day. And we don't know who somebody else might be in center. You know, one of these other guys that are in the pipeline. Find out who they are. And then if they don't measure up, like you said, next man up. Let's go. But winning breeds winning. So it's very important this team gets off to a hot start. By the way, I'm still not convinced. I I don't think it's coming. I haven't heard anything like this. But... I'm, I'm still nervous that we're going to have a pre-opening day trade with Shane Bieber. Shane Bieber's like, in the last Thursday? year of team control. What? By Thursday? Yes. I'm nervous by, about that. Because here's the thing. They have to decide at some point he's gone. At right. some point, unless they're at the break in first place or within striking distance. But if you ride it out with him, you get nothing for him. I, and, you know, I thought it was, I, I think it's very ironic that once again, for the fifth straight year, we talk about trading him. He's getting, he's getting the opening day start. And look at his, <laughs> his last two performances in Arizona. He's been old Shane Bieber. He's been Cy Young Award Shane Bieber. And what scares me about that is if there were concerns from teams, and there were, about his arm because of the way he pitched last year with the injuries, he's erasing any and all doubt by his, his velocity is up again. And we're going to have Tom Hamilton on later in the show, so we'll talk more about that with Tom. And when, and when is, I don't yeah. think they're going to trade him. I've just been a You're fan of this organization of for long happened. enough. Yeah. I know that it's an option. And if, if where they're sitting today, they don't think they can make a, a run at the division, and if they're thinking that, I don't know how they're getting to that conclusion, then they may make a move on opening day if they can get a lot of prospects for McNuggets, them. McNuggets, yeah. when are we going to do our, our predictions for uh, win totals for the Guardians? Uh We'll do some prop bets on player stuff tomorrow, Wednesday and Thursday. We'll do our win over. All right, I'm not going to be over. here. So I, I was texting with a friend of mine today who works at ESPN. He's a Guardians fan. I've been here 83s. And, 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 and this, this goes to what I said about the Cavs a little while ago. We're, we're, we're debating win total. And I said, I know this sounds like a cop-out, but I'm anywhere from 75 to 90. <laughs> <laughs> no. That's crazy. That's like, it's like the, wow, well, you that's know. best case and worst case scenario. If you throw a wide enough net, you're bound to get it right. 
And I understand that. But see, here's the problem for me. I don't know about Shane Bieber. Or I, Class A. Last year, they were within a couple of games in Minnesota, and they dealt their best starting pitcher heck, away. Heck, they got Carrasco in the starting. He's, he's and the by the way, Carrasco's been okay. And yeah. I watched Cookie throw down in Arizona. I think he's still got some life to him. I do, but yeah, we'll see. he's a fifth starter, and he's a bridge to get Gavin Williams back. But So, I don't know, but then he said, no, no, no. You know that we don't do that. What's the win total? And I came back with 88. So, I I'm, I'm still optimistic on the high side. I'm well, wait. Vegas has him I'm, at 79 and a half. I'm going to wait mine so. out. Wow, 79 and a half. Yeah. See, We're I would take the more Guardians with Tom Hamilton coming up in about half an hour. There's also more Guardians mm. talk tonight, 3 o'clock, the inaugural Ultimate Guardian show with Bull and Zach. Mizell, Mizell, Mizell. I don't remember. It's which Mizell, one. isn't it? Yeah, both said it wrong the other day, and now it's stuck in my head the wrong way. Zach Mizell and Adam the Bull. Three o'clock. By the today. way, you're not going to find a better no, tandem, best tandem in the city. of guys to talk baseball, I, 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 just about anywhere. No. Bull is as knowledgeable a baseball guy as I know. You can nerd and out. And Zach this. is Zach just is tremendous. Yeah. Like, I hope Guardians fans realize how lucky. Same thing with our Cavs lineup and our Browns lineups. These shows are. The amount of quality that we're throwing at our viewers right now is unbelievable. It's but bad. watch this if you're a Guardians fan. 3 o'clock today for the Guardians, 5 o'clock for G. Is that the, the very first show. one? Very first one That's, today. Wow. So make sure you guys tune in. We're All lucky right. to have that. We're going to do a little mock draft here on UCSS for the Browns. We are one month away to the day from the first round of the 2024 NFL draft. The Browns don't pick till day two, barring any trades. So we're going to use PFF's mock draft simulator to run through a few possible scenarios for the Browns. We'll see how PFF grades us, and if you're in the chat, grade the picks as well. I sent this out last night and asked you guys to send one in, but then we realized you can't share a login. So we're going to do this together. So are you guys ready to run through a mock draft together? I am. For the first one, G, I'm going to turn off trades, okay? Okay. So we're going to pick in all the traditional spots the Browns have, 54, 85, 156, 206, and 243. Uh, give me one sec. Okay, you ready? Yes, Let's sir. do it. The draft has officially started on the board with who is left for the Browns at number 54. The top 10 prospects, Javon Buller, the safety from Georgia, Ricky Pearsall, the wide receiver from Florida, a defensive end, Adisa Isaac from Ohio, uh, from Penn State, excuse me, Jatavian Sanders, the tight end from Texas, Jermaine Burton, the receiver from Alabama, Jonah Ellis, an edge defender from Utah. Rook or Horo from Clemson, a defensive interior lineman. Or Jonathan Brooks, the running back from Texas. Wow. I guess it's a matter of what position you think they most need help at. So where do you want to go with the first I'll pick? let you guys go first. <laughs> I mean, I did a mock draft one. And I, I, the first mock draft I did on Ultimate Browns, I, I, I took uh, Jatavian Sanders. He's a hybrid tight end slash wide receiver for Texas. Um, he's he's just he's, those are the guys that are all of a sudden have a ton like, of value. Like yeah. they just like the, the value, hybrid tight end the hybrid, receiver. and you know you already know what Kevin Stefanski is leaning towards. You know, like I gotta have six tight ends. You don't. You got rid of uh, old boy. Um, what's his name? Uh, Harrison Bryant. Harrison Bryant, with, uh, the all time Raiders. yeah all time Sound snap guy. I that's what I took. But Pearsall is a guy. Um, and uh, the dude from Alabama has been moving yeah. up to. That's the, the one that. Burton. Yeah, Burton, Burton raises yeah. my eyebrows a lot. He, uh, you would have three up. Alabama receivers on this team. I wouldn't. You I would. I wouldn't. I wouldn't mind. And you know me, I'm a, <laughs> Operation Stockpile to the fullest. I need another receiver. Do we? Are we at a consensus of, at the position that they should take? I, I'm still in the wide receiver camp. I'm, I'm, still I'm wide. firmly in the I'm wide still receiver wide. camp. I would. I wouldn't take a linebacker that high in the second round. Um, I don't think they – everybody else is pretty – they pretty much restocked their defensive line. Right. Um, they don't need an offensive lineman. I'm looking for another another uh, wide receiver to push us. Uh, Earl, are you in the wide receiver I would too? take a wide receiver, but I'm not opposed to them taking an the offensive lineman either, especially yeah. a guard. I think that when you look at the interior of the Browns' offensive line, Joe Batonio and Wyatt Teller make a lot of money. But they're also aging veterans. Yeah, solid players, good players, but not guys that I I don't expect both of those dudes to be on this team, at least at the same time, uh, for too much longer. Right. And I think eventually you got to start getting younger or or kind of cheaper on your offensive line, so to speak. So if you can get you a quality guard or, or tackle, you know, with with your first pick, and, and there's not so a you're wide receiver, receiver but there. you're also looking at 
But I'm also looking at the offensive, offensive line as well. I would, I would go with Burton or Jatavian Sanders. So Burton or Sanders, Jay, who you want to go with? Yeah, I'm going to go with Burton just because I'm, I'm intrigued by the idea of having three Alabama Let's receivers. go Burton. I, I like Burton. having blue blood college players yeah, on Burton. my team. I don't like it when they go, you know, off the board. And not to say that there's not great talent there, but the Louisiana Monroe guys the Western, have been playing against – the Western you know, Kentucky. Yeah, give me somebody who week in and week out has played against the best competition. And when you're coming from the SEC, uh, I, I think the SEC is where I'd really like to live. The Big Ten, it's Ohio State and Michigan, and those guys pad their stats because they're playing a lot of below-average teams. In the Southeastern Conference, I think the quality of football across the board is higher, so I'm always going to lean towards the SEC player. And I think, unless I can be convinced otherwise, I still think that we do not have the wide receiver core that we're going to need to have to win this division. I'm not in it to be, you know, to be competitive. So we, we took Burton with the first pick. Uh, yeah. According to the PFF mock draft simulator, for our second pick at 85, Blake Corum's on the board, running back from Michigan. Wow. The running backs, Bucky Irvin and Trey Benson, Oregon and Florida State. You have Jeremiah Trotter Jr., the linebacker from Clemson. Michael Hall, the defensive tackle from Ohio State. Uh, Brendan Rice, son of Jerry Rice, the receiver from USC, hmm. if you want to double down on receiver. No guards, Earl, that really match up with the average draft position, according to Pro Football Focus, unless you want to go with Christian Mahogany from Boston College, who I am completely unfamiliar with. The Blake Corum thing is very intriguing to me. Between him and Hall from Ohio State, I'm going Hall. Hall is a pass rusher. I think he's he feels fits the type of build that uh, Jim Schwartz wants to have as far as pass rusher. Are we good at running back now? I know there were some moves made I, while I was gone. I, Blake, but Blake, Blake, Blake Corum is interesting, but I think that I mean you already got four running backs on your roster. But Corum's body type is what fascinates me. Yeah. He's a low to the ground, low center of gravity, yeah. shifty, yeah. and he played in a great conference. Yeah, he did. Yeah. And when he played Ohio State. He always had success. I mean, he, and he's going. That's a top tier defense. Oh my yeah. goodness! I mean, but if you look at the projections of the running backs this year, Corum might be the first running back off the board in the third and round. And to think that he's still available, and, and that's that. That's kind of crazy. But I don't it, think he's going to be there. If you look at that I think list Jim of players, will take him out in L.A. Those, if he's that, there. Those list lady. of players, man, give me Hall. The, the, give me give me that versatile defensive lineman that can play inside, outside, right. that can come in here, be groomed under Jim Schwartz. And um, you, you get to another rotating body on that defensive line because at the end of the day, you know, football is still won and lost in the trenches. And, you know, I would like to think that the Browns are still going to be playing meaningful football come December. So having more guys on the interior of the line uh, uh, towards the end of that year, right. that's available to you. I would, I would take Hall. Now, listen, I would be – I'm not going to hate. I would be very – it'd be tough for me to pass on Coral. It'd be – because I would, to me, he's the shiny object. Isn't yeah, it's it's like oh, I didn't because here's that's what happens in the draft. You didn't think he was gonna be there, right? And so if you don't think he's gonna be there, you ain't even like having the whole conversation. All the other guys, you didn't had a, a thought process about. You, you know what scares me, and I can't get this out of my head, was we drafted Peppers, and I was prepared to embrace him. I'm like, you know, I, I used to can't stand that guy, but Did nothing. now that he's ours, I think I'm going to root for him. And then I, just everything I saw from him, I'm like, nothing. this guy's horrible. Nothing. Horrible. So who do you want to go with here, Corum or Michael Hall? I think Hall for me. I would go with is. Michael Hall. All right, next pick. It is simulating the next. By the way, 64 when, picks. When you dra- um, it's easy to re-simulate these drafts. I wonder, out of ten simulated drafts, how many of them? Would have Burton available. Well, we're going to do 54. two of these right now, so we'll see. If okay, he's yeah, I'm just curious to see. Like, is he a slam dunk to be available guy, or is he a fringe guy that might likely be gone? His average draft position, according to PFF, was 53, so right oh, around where the wow. Browns would be picking. Roman Wilson, by the way, was the pick ahead of the Browns at okay. 54 in this season. Because I would, I mean, he, I, I like him too. All right, for the next pick, 156. Too. Uh, Michael Barrett, the linebacker from Michigan. You have a receiver from USC, Taj Washington. You have a safety. Wow. Pick a position. I'll tell you where you, some guys available. But most of these well, guys, you're not going to I remember them. Washington. Washington was, had a nice career at USC. He did. I'm surprised they would have him available in what round? This is pick 156, round five, pick 21. They say he's, he should have been drafted 10 spots ago, according to their average. Yeah, average. I would be. I would be if, he, if he's sitting there, and I know it sounds like, uh-oh, now you've got – 
too many wide receivers. You can never have too many wide receivers. But if he's sitting there, which I don't think he will be, I would be tempted to take him. What happened to the linebacker? That Bear, Col- 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 Colson is number 25 for Michigan, right? Yeah, Barrett was. I don't I what can't number, tell you what number was, was off the top of my head. I can look at it. I up. can't remember what number I it was. Remember, either, but I, I remember heard his name yeah, a lot. Yeah, uh, he. Uh, you know, it's so funny. If you were to ask. He's 23, G. 23. He's number 23. Um, do you think with Operation Stockpile, do you think that we're okay at wide receiver? If you, we already drafted Burton, sure. You do. So you yeah. wouldn't draft two. I ain't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know what scares me, guys? I know that we talked about this before I was gone, and I reached out to a couple of folks about Jerry, uh, Jerry Rice's kid. And I know the consensus is he's going to be a later draft pick. I'm, I, he just scares the hell out of me letting him sit there. Pedigree. Yeah, yeah. And that's it. Pedigree. Well, he's off the board at this point. No, I know he was, but he was still available with the fourth pick. Last pick, correct. So was Jeremiah uh, Trotterski. I know he was. Pedigree. I, pe- I love pedigree. <laughs> I like I like Michael Barrett. I would probably take him. Um, I would take him at linebacker. You got another linebacker, Michigan linebacker, Devin Bush. You yeah, but this organization you, devalues linebackers. They they just seem to think that they can get them anywhere. Um, well, listen, hey, you're going to have to figure it out. You, get, you need four or five of them. I think if you have one or two, that's, to me, it looks like that if you have one or two that can be standouts, I think that's all you need. You can mask the and, efficient and, player. And, and the Jim Short scheme, you probably need one or two that's impact guys or right. standout and guys. We have, do we, I think we have We got that two. in Jock, you know, right. and I think Jordan Hicks is going to come in here and, and be that other linebacker. Okay. And then the rest of these dudes will be rotational guys that, you know, will come in, get these other guys a breather. But I just don't think that the linebacker position is highlighted that much in the scheme that Jim Short. So can we come to a consensus with this with this third pick for the Browns? Fifth round, third pick. Linebacker, receiver. Yeah. There's a center on the board. I just don't think I don't think Taj Williams is gonna be there. Um but if he is, I'm taking him. Anyone else feel strongly, or should we put Taj Washington as the or Washington, yeah. Pick? Let's go Taj. By the way, I still think, I know that the, yeah. at, at the top of the draft, this is a foregone conclusion. I think they're getting it wrong. What? Caleb? I, yeah, I think they're getting it wrong. Me too. Earl, you said you want an interior guard. Give How me about, the LSU uh, quarterback. Jaden like Daniels. Daniels huh? I love him. Earl, Arm. you said you wanted an interior lineman. You have Javion Cohen from Miami. A guard is the best available prospect on the board here. Miami of... Ohio Miami, or Miami. University no, of Miami? No, Miami, Miami. Okay. The U. Uh, you got a center from Wisconsin, Tanner Bordellini. Andrew Coker, a guard from TCU. Or a bunch of other random guys. Depends on position. You have Frank Gore Jr. on the board, too, if you want another running back. No. Hmm. Isn't that nuts? His dad just left the league a couple years ago. We'll take that guard. That running back. We'll take that guard. <laughs> he, played, guard? He, he played pretty much throughout his son's college career. That's crazy. He did. <laughs> that's, that's wild. He had him young, and, and he had a long <laughs> career. Despite what looked like a devastating injury that would have ended his career yeah. 25 years ago. I mean. And our last pick, G, give me a position. Where do you want to go position wise for the last? The best available players are a tight end from Arizona, Tanner McLaughlin, uh, Talia Tagalavoa, to his little brother. No, he is. He, the Browns aren't taking it. No, Rasheen man. Ali, a running back, uh, Trevin Wallace, a linebacker from Kentucky, and then a bunch of guys who. Tagalavoa is coming out early. And he's still on the board in our mock at the fifth round. What is it? Seventh, seventh round. Seventh round. What and, is this kid thinking? And he coming out early, but, did, but, been there, but he was there 10 years. Like, well, he had a COVID year, but he, he still had the opportunity to play one more that's year. That's crazy. There. Sam Hartman, the quarterback from Notre Dame, also on the board. No, nah, we're not doing that. That uh, was the pert hair commercial dude, right? Mm, the dude with all the hair? Yes. yes. Hmm. Yeah, no, we're not going quarterback. Hey, give, me, um, give me that tight end. We didn't go tight end early, so we go tight end. All right, let's okay. see what PFF gives us as our overall grade here before we talk <laughs> a little David and Joku. Overall grade, we got a B minus according to PFF. A B for the Burton pick, a C plus for Michael Hall, a B minus for Taj Washington, a B plus for JV on Cohen, and a C plus for Tanner McLaughlin. All right. All right. B. I like that. That's passing grade. Yes, sir. And We're really, quick, Jay, the- just because you asked, is Jermaine Burton there in the second reiteration? Jermaine Burton is still there in the oh, second iteration. Good. So that's your first official UCSS mock draft. We'll do that every Monday. 
What, what, what's the guy I'm pulling for? I hope on, we get on the second one. Who's the, what's the biggest name available in the second one? Uh, Chris Braswell, the edge defender from Alabama, who is the 37th overall rated prospect. Mm. That's, wow. not, a, that's not a bad pick either. No, that would be a great. You know, I know that some GMs always say, you know, we don't draft by need. We draft by best available. Mm-hmm. I always thought that was silly. Like, you, you have to consider need. You just have to. Or, because I always tell people. Or you're the Cavs. You're stuck with too many of the same thing. You, you, you lying to yourself because think about it like this. Say, for instance, ooh, Michael Penix dropped to you in the second oh, round. Oh, Penix Don't is even also do on that. the – Penix is on the board in this situation. So, well. so Wait, Penix is still there at 30, at 54? A, on the second reiteration of the PFF. So, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so you're going to take him? My God. You can't I, take him. You can't take him. You, you know can't you can't take him. Take him. You but, can. But, you but, know but, you, you can't do it, Jay. You, listen, I know they won't. That, but, they, but I'll hey, tell listen, you. The Green Bay I, Packers, would, Packers be doing it. I would tell you what. I, I would have to consider it because you, you'd have to trade DTR immediately. Yeah. You, you know, you're basically saying that the guy you drafted last year is not who we thought he was. And we might have enough hay in the barn it, to make that decision. They, it, now watch this. But man, thing. I love Penix's game. I just don't think it, I don't think he's going to be there. If, teams it, teams are too tempted by quarterbacks. If Drake May, for some reason, start sliding like Aaron Rodgers will slide, right, right. The, what what are you, you going to do? What are you going to do? It's a conundrum that I can't imagine in a million years we get to. This I can't. Year. Right. <laughs> I can't we got to talk about the current Browns QB one here. And before we do that. You can say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the NCAA tournament. Oh, man, Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it's time to chilling. go dancing on America's number one sports book right now. New customers get $200 in bonus bets if their first $5 bet wins. That's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. Just visit FanDuel.com slash UCSS and bet on college hoops until they cut the nets down. Over the weekend, Mary Kay Cabot reported that Deshaun Watson's first rehab throwing session in Los Angeles went successful. He's joined by David Njoku and his quarterback trainer, Quincy Avery, for this rehab process, and Njoku was kind enough to hop on the QB Unplugged Lockerverse podcast with Quincy and Deshaun to talk about the 2023 season, getting ready for 2024. And there was one bite in particular that we're going to play here in a sec that kind of stood out. It was David Njoku speaking about the toughness Deshaun uh, displayed during that 14 for 14 second half performance against Baltimore. I want to warn you. Playing on a bad ankle. Playing on a bad ankle, a bad shoulder. He does curse in here. We do not uh, advise for explicit language, but you can't bleep stuff out of tag board. We so, curse. Well, he says an, a word we don't use. Okay. So I just want to let people know. It's not a word that no one on our audience has ever heard. I'm sure before. you've heard it. But if, you, okay. if you've got a young child around and you don't want him yes. to hear it, here's your warning. I'll just give you the warning. Just, uh, and then the school. question... <laughs> question after we play this yeah. clip is knowing what we know about the injury the opponent we're now almost six months removed from that performance have we forgotten how impressive that second half performance against baltimore was here's david and joku on the toughness that sean watson showed but no one knows how hurt he really is <laughs> like we don't yeah. know i knew how hurt he was yeah. right and the, the team did the, the, the guys right. on the team but yeah. you hear all these other people like oh he's soft he's not really doing this that and the third how do you as a teammate be like making sure people know like nah we we know man we look, know our uh, guys really you know what i'm saying man, on some on some real shit man 98 percent of things that happen to us to sean and myself or whoever nobody knows and that's what hurts the most is because you know you have a guy like Deshaun who is literally i mean i mean listen i'm not i i keep it real all mm-hmm. right keep it a bean <laughs> i've had a high angles before mm-hmm. that bitch hurts like a motherfucker <laughs> hey, yeah. that shit hurts so bad i i couldn't walk i mm-hmm. thought i was a big old macho man i couldn't do nothing he tore shoulder right tore tore my shoulder and had a high angles in the same game and still beat the juggernaut ravens you know what i mean that's, yeah. that's something that people don't really like comprehend the right way you know what i mean and seeing all that stuff on social media and stuff it, it's 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 sad because it's you know uh you know the, the saying ignorance is bliss in this case it's not really bliss because you don't know and it's it's you don't know all the efforts and stuff but do like you know bring done behind closed doors that, that we do that he does you know what i mean so it's it's it's, it's tough because i know he's he, he's strong minded but that like you just don't like seeing that especially when you're giving it your all for you know a city but no one knows hmm. thoughts on the comments and have we forgotten how impressive 
and how incredible that performance so, was. So for me, I, I watched this, and I remember telling you about this Saturday. Um, the NFL is a results-oriented business, right? And fans will voice their displeasure when they don't get their ROI, their return on an investment. And so what's the return on investment for a fan? It's time, it's, it's, it's money, it's, it's emotional, right? That's yeah. what it is. You spend right. money on tailgating, you spend money on going to these games, uh, you spend time, time that you could be doing, doing other things that might be more productive than, than watching the sport. And if you're a Browns fan, if you're in this city, the emotional investment that most of us, us have in sports is, is mass, it's, it's, it's up there. And to watch this podcast and to hear David Njoku talk about the 98% of what they go through, the public never hears about it. And then he talks about the 2% that might get out there and, and was put out there. I can understand how it can be hard to ignore that. I can understand the, the frustrations that might come with that. I don't think these players have an issue with constructive criticism. I don't think they have an issue with being criticized at all. I think that comes with the territory. Mm -hmm. I think what a lot of the players have an issue with is the disrespect. Because, you know, he didn't play this part of the clip, but there's a part of the clip to where Deshaun Watson says, sometimes these athletes come to social media as an outlet or just to see some news or break from their everyday reality. You, fans don't often know how much some of these players care about the Cleveland Browns organization, about the city of Cleveland and their fan base, right? These dudes can be behind closed doors, like, like giving their all and putting forth the best effort, but they will get disrespected because the effort don't always equal out to the result that the fan wants to see. Yeah. And so like it, 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 I can understand why, and it was cool to get that perspective of like, listen, we are going hard for the city. We going hard for the Cleveland Browns and we put ourselves through so much to make sure that we can come out here and at least give the effort and to go back and see somebody being disrespected because the results didn't yield what you wanted, knowing that I gave my all, I can understand how that can bother you. Yeah, um, you know, I, I, I look at it um, in terms of this, and, and one of the things that I, I look back and, and say, sometimes I, I always give you and say, you know, he's played 11 games. There's, a, you know, there, he's been injured, that part of it, you know, kind of takes away from it. Uh, he's been suspended, so people don't get their ROI on that. But I had to learn, and I, I, I asked myself this. It's like there's a difference between you starting a relationship with somebody um, in elementary school or somebody in high school. You got friends that you may have had since you was grade school this high. You know what I'm saying? You guys drank juice, took naps together, super pause. Um, but, you know, you was young, <laughs> little kid. And you, you grow up, you fight, and it's all good. But then you get to high school, you may just know somebody, right? You get to high school, and you acquaintance, you in, in a class together. It's a different level of, of what you'll take from somebody because guess what? At this point, you we old. How many new friends do you get? <laughs> like, right. like you, you just don't get no new friends, bro. You, you, like if you came home and you, you introduced somebody to your wife, say, hey, this is my new friend, John. She look at you crazy. Like, dang, Jay, you got to pick up John. John, you, you, you just pick up friends? Where did this happen? And that's the same way it happens <laughs> with, with, with Deshaun Watson and, and quarterbacks. Like, I realized that when you draft Baker Mayfield, you're invested. You went through the whole offseason picking the best quarterback, right? Then you get to see him walk across the stage. They put the jersey up. They get the hat. They do all the interviews. Then you go through the record-breaking first year. Then it's like the Jets game. You, then he breaks the passing records. And then you go through ups and downs and injuries until finally you get to see it all the way out till you win a playoff game. And for me, I didn't understand why there was an attachment level like that. But you have to realize it. When you go through all them life's goals, somebody could have met, like you could say, I. Baker Mayfield, I remember watching him in college, man. And then I got married and had kids. And Baker Mayfield was the quarterback of my team. This is like, you went through some stuff with this man. So he going to get the benefit of the doubt. So sometimes I would be like, but Baker played like 80 games. Brian Hoare played all these games. Brandon Wheaton. Why does it seem like they get that benefit of the doubt? And then I realized, John Watson is your high school friend. He's the guy you just started working with. He's a dude like that was in the office for two weeks 
and then he says something crazy. You're like, I don't even like you, bro. <laughs> Just off one comment. But that's been right or wrong or indifferent. That's how we look at people and, and, and how they're endeared to us. So it's, it's tough for Deshaun or, or guys to be like, hey, man, why ain't everybody buying in? Like he did all this on one leg and his shoulder and all this other good stuff. But the reality of it is that ain't that's just regular stuff. You ain't we ain't grown with you. We ain't bought into you yet. And, and it's difficult to do that. Before you go, Jay, I just want to respond to that. I got to get some pushback on that a little bit because David Njoku was drafted by the Cleveland Browns. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about return on, on investment mm -hmm. or the effort not necessarily yielding the results that fans wants to see, mm -hmm. I think he's a prime example of that. He's a dude that was a first round pick that for the first three years of his career, first five, Cle first three, four, five, Cleveland Browns fans were hot and cold with David Njoku mm -hmm. because they wasn't receiving, they wasn't receiving return on investment. They seen this dude that's a physical freak of nature, mm -hmm. but he was consistently inconsistent as a player. And what happened? The return on investment changed. You start seeing David Njoku like ball out, develop as a player more and more. And now it is, he's one of Cleveland's favorite sons. He's one of Cleveland's favorite players. Yeah, that's a good example. But, but and, I, will, I will give you pushback on that. But if he was not drafted by the Browns, he oh, would have been gone. But lot, I, I, will, I, 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 I will say this though. The issue I believe that fans have is because they're not seeing the return on investment with Deshaun Watson, right? They can see the effort and they can respect the effort, but that don't mean that they don't feel some type of way. That don't mean yeah. that they don't, they're not like internally frustrated. And because I think they know his potential and they know he's, he's better. He, he's, he's capable of playing better than what he's played. Right. And I think that if he was to go out here, stay healthy for 17 games and like ball his ass off, play his ass off and like really lead the Browns to the promised land. I don't think we will have conversations going forward about his, his, his lack of about his commitment, his effort, his play, et cetera. So I, I, I just think he got to go out there and perform. I agree. There is something to what G says about your status in the fandom based on how are you, how you were, were acquired, but I'll, I'll use as another example, Joe Flacco. We didn't draft Joe, right? In fact, Joe was our mortal enemy for enemy. 10 years. He was the ops. He was our mortal enemy. We hated that man. He came in here in two weeks. We loved him. Still Why? Because he won. It's a, you said it, it's a results-oriented business. You win, you get the biscuit. You lose, you get the bitching. And that's how it goes. And I talked earlier in the show about two things that I'll bring up again. The, the social media thing. He knows how the fans individually feel because mm -hmm. he's out there looking for it. He says he does. He sees everything that's put on his name on social media. Mm -hmm. Why would anybody ever Google themselves on social media? I don't know. Because you're going to get the good, but you're going to get the bad too. And you're going to be affected by it. Tune out the noise. It's noise. It doesn't matter. I've never heard one player stand at the Super Bowl podium as they're holding the trophy and say, I'd like to thank social media. Because of them, I'm standing here on top of the mountain. It doesn't work that way. And the other thing, too, I said every team, every player as you're assessing them, if you're going to give them a fair judgment and grade, you're going to look at the ceiling mm -hmm. and the floor. Mike, can we call up the Ravens numbers? The first half versus second half? Yep. Yep, Steve. In one football game of Deshaun's 11-game career here in Cleveland, which is far too brief to right. make any passing judgments. I agree. We're still, we're still acquiring information, okay? Too early. But what I would say uh, about the Baltimore game is, you want to see his floor? It's the first half. You want to see his ceiling? It's the second half. In one three-hour span... He showed us he can be one of the worst quarterbacks in the league. If you're 6-20 and 20 for a season, yeah. you're 30% completion percentage, you're out of the league. Yeah. So, but if you're second half to Sean, you're the MVP of the league. So you talk about a disparity between floor and ceiling, you may not find a more glaring example. Look, I get that Patrick Mahomes has his stretches, particularly this year. Before this year, we hadn't seen bad Pat. This year, go back and watch the second half we of the Denver game. We see Bad Pat. We saw Bad Pat a lot this year. 
But we know this. When good Pat's on the field, they can win Super Bowls. And he was good Pat in the Super Bowl, and they won it. So, on the whole, I need more love. Stop caring. It doesn't matter. It's not going to put a dollar in your bank account. It's not going to put a touchdown pass on your stats. And I'm not saying you completely tune out the fans, mm-hmm. but you shouldn't either play for them or worry about them while you're on the field. I'll, I'll say this. Play your game. I'll, I'll say this because I know we got to go. I get your point, right? Deshaun Watson should tune that out. But I think that people have to understand that we are living in a social media era and we that are. we are dealing with different generations of people. He can tune it out all day long, right? But depending on where Deshaun Watson comes from and the type of people that, that's associated with him, they might not tune that out. They and, already know who Deshaun and they, is. They, they might want to be reactive it, to feel like they got to defend Let them their react. boy. Let them react and, and defend. But when he does it, it looks weak. I, I, just, I, just, I just feel like you, you have to be able to take the criticism. It comes with it. It does. It's just that when they get disrespectful and people make things personal, that's when people are triggered emotionally. I get it, but if you don't go looking for it, you won't see it. You can tune it out. You can't completely tune it out because if you're in the stadium and you're playing bad, you're going to hear the boos. But Deshaun is smart. He's strong mentally. I believe he is. I just think he should care much less about what people are saying about him because guess what? Even when he wins, we've talked about this, because of his past, he's still going to have haters. He's still going to find things on social media that are negative about him. You don't find it if you don't look for it. Play football. Worry about the results. Be second half Ravens, Deshaun. And you will be embraced and loved by this city like no other athlete ever has. Speaking of being embraced and loved by the city, very few people are embraced and loved in Cleveland like the one and only Tom Hanks. That's a fact. You can listen to him on the radio coming up here in just a few days. And if you (laughs) want to go to a Guardians game, you better be buying your tickets with Game Time. It's the fastest and easiest way to buy tickets for all your sporting events this summer with killer last-minute deals and all-in prices, views from the seat, and the best price guarantee. Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. Just download the Game Time app today, create an account, and use promo code LOCKEDON for $20 off your first purchase once again create an account redeem code locked on for twenty dollars off download game time today last minute tickets lowest prices guaranteed and with that let's welcome in the legendary voice of the cleveland guardians it is the one the only tom hamilton hey hey, hey. tommy good to see you my friend good to see you guys thanks for having me thanks for the kind words mike (laughs) tom you're aware of uh just something called q rating i mean you're you're working in the broadcast field (laughs) Q rating is basically a quotient that, uh, that combines recognizability and likability. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think Mike's introduction is dead on, Tom. And how lucky are we in Cleveland to have not one but two? I think if you were able to take a Q rating of Tom Hamilton and Jim Donovan, they would break the Q rating scale. They would both be, I, I mean, they all know them. They all love them. There's nobody, I've never heard anybody say, yeah, Tom Hamilton, he's not good at calling a baseball game. We you just can't do it. You haven't read my mail, Jay. You haven't <laughs> read my mail. No, all, all honesty, when was the last time you received a negative letter, email? I know you probably don't do social media, but come on, no. Tom. No one's saying no. anything <laughs> bad about you. No, you know what? And, and look, guys, we're all in this business. And, you know, now I'm a lot older than you three. But there was no such thing as social media. There was no such thing as cell phones when I got into the business. So I'm dating myself. But, I mean, look, you're never going to please everybody. I get plenty of people that complain. I get it. Um, but at the end of the day, if, um, if your boss is like you, if the majority of your audience likes you, and if you feel that you've put in an honest day's work, I think that's all you can go by. Um, yeah, it was fun listening to you guys, <clears throat> excuse me, on the social media aspect. I don't get it. I never have. Um, I think it's a cesspool. And I, I just, um, I feel bad what it's done for athletes because I think there are a lot of athletes that have gotten so caught up in it. And I've talked to coaches, you know, I did Big Ten basketball um, on television for 25 years until a few years ago. And, and it's one of the most difficult things they had to deal with prior to everything else that has now transpired here with the, the transport portal and the NIL and, and whatnot. But, you know, you'd, you'd have guys going into the 
the locker room at halftime to check their social media. Oh. And you, you know, you just can't live your life worrying about what other people think because then you're going to have a miserable life. But I think it really does impact a lot of guys and, and not in a positive way. So, um, you know, my wife is my best critic and she's not afraid to let me know when she disapproves. So uh, I've been smart enough to listen to her and keep my job. Well, you already knew this, but you married the right woman. That's, we, we That's all right. That. We all need that. You know, Tom, we go right from social media to um, the new uh, thing around, you know, legalized gambling. You know, we got mm -hmm. the Shohei, Shohei Otani thing. And, uh, you know, it, it potentially hasn't. We haven't heard gambling like that since Pete Rose and different things like that. Um, the league's doing an investigation. What was your, your initial thoughts when you heard about it? And, and what are your thoughts on where it may, may go uh, after this in, in investigation? Yeah, the, the, those are great questions. And I think all of pro sports, this is their biggest fear. I mean, we've had what? How many football players here? that um, have been banged. I'm trying to think of the wide receiver from Ohio State that Jameson transferred, Williams, right? Yeah. Jameson Williams. Yeah. And so, you know, it it's going to impact and has already impacted every sport. To your point, um, look, I don't know enough about the Shohei case, and I don't know enough about gambling. Again, it's something I don't do. I have plenty of vices. That's not <laughs> one of them. Um, Common sense would tell me there's a lot more to this story from the standpoint of how does an interpreter who's making whatever get four and a half million dollars behind um, with a bookmaker? I mean, yes. those bookmakers yeah. expect to be paid at some point. So I, you know, again, it's whether it's baseball, football, basketball, hockey, you know, we've opened Pandora's box now when it comes to gambling and whether you're against it or for it, the bottom line is it's here and you're not putting the genie back in the bottle. And this is going to be an ongoing thing that will concern all pro sports leagues because as we all know in our business, whether you're a broadcaster or whether you're a, a sports entertainment uh, facility, if you don't have credibility, you're done. And so, you know, we can't have people wondering about the games, the outcomes, you know, remember the Tim Don guy case, the NBA official, yeah. it, it seems like that was another lifetime ago. But, I mean, there's so much, you know, the thing, I, I, I think the Cleveland Plain Dealer did a story. Obviously, I've been out in Arizona here for quite a while. But I thought I saw it, was it last week or what now, with the Cavs coach, uh, Coach yeah, yeah. staff. Yes. yes. And, and, and the people that are now, you know, taking it out on him or taking it out on players when a bet goes wrong, these are all of the – unintended consequences that come with what we're dealing with now and guys i i'm i'm fearful of what's coming down the road i really am yeah uh, tom before we turn to talk to the guardians and and their upcoming season i'll just throw one thing on top of what you just said there was a clip of social media that was going around a, a couple of weeks ago i brought it to mike's attention and we showed it on the program there was a player in the nba who was sitting on a bench and there was a fan who was sitting courtside right behind him and said, mm -hmm. I'm one three-pointer shy of, what was it, a $10,000 yeah, hit? I think it was 12, 10, yeah. And he, the player looked at him and mouthed, I got you, and told the coach he wanted to go back in the game. He went back in the game, immediately shot a three, and made it. Yeah. And oh it, was, it was like, I, we've, we've heard these stories, mm -hmm. but it also shows just what kind of impact yeah. these guys can actually have, where they can take the team... The, the the goal of the team, which is obviously to win, and just say you're going to put that to the side for five nights and you're going to shoot 30 times so you can make sure that you, you eclipse whatever the overline is for your point score. There is so much money to be had. And unfortunately, as we know, whenever there's big money involved, there's also going to be corruption. And quickly, I'll just get your thought on this before we move on. As much as I think the Pete Rose thing was so punitive, and, and I love Pete as a player and what he meant to the game, and as much as I hate that he will probably won't get in while he's alive, I do think that it sent the clear message that this is the cardinal rule. You cannot break it, and if you do, you are excommunicated from the sport forever. 
And what the NFL has done and some of the other leagues, that when they've caught guys breaking this rule, is they've slapped them on the wrist with a four-game suspension or a six-game suspension, and that just tells every other player that's watching, I can do this, make piles of money, and still have my, my job. Uh, you know, Jay, I'm, I'm 100% in agreement. I've never had any sympathy for Pete Rose. I loved watching him play when he played because he played the game the right way. But that has been in every clubhouse as you leave to go down that tunnel to get onto the field. That, that That's the last thing a lot of clubhouses you ever saw about gambling. Yeah. And, and so it was clear. And I, I always loved the Pete Rose backers that said, well, he never bet on the Reds to lose. Yeah, that means well, nothing. What message do you think he sent on the days he didn't bet? That's right. He's telling so, the bookies Pete doesn't like his chances tonight. So, you know what? Hey, you know, we raised four kids, and I have the same lessons from my mom and dad. There are consequences for your actions. I don't want to hear your excuse. Right. Deal with the consequences. You knew what you were getting into. I, I, like I said, I have no sympathy whatsoever for Pete Rose. I have no sympathy for anybody that uh, that breaks these rules. They know going in what's at stake. And um, I'm, I'm afraid, and I hope I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm afraid this is going to become a bigger and bigger story in all sports. And, you know, it could be the thing that could ruin ruin our games because there's you, you just feel there are too many people that can be compromised. Yeah. Tom, the, uh, first of all, hi. It's always a pleasure when you oh, yeah. are on the show, <laughs> Mr. OG Tom Hamilton. Uh, the oh, Cleveland Guardians, uh, they get their season started Thursday with a four-game trip, uh, four-game series against the Oakland A's. And Stephen Vogt uh, essentially is inheriting the same core that Terry Francona had. Of course, we're going to see a lot of the young prospects this year mm -hmm. because Chris Antonetti says we want to see what we got. What can Steven Vogt get out of this 2024 Guardians team that Terry Francona couldn't get out of them last season? Well, um, one, I, you know, I think Steven Vogt's got a chance to be really good and a really good manager. But that being said, um, Cleveland's issue wasn't Tito. Uh, Cleveland's issue was injuries. And any time that Cleveland under Tito didn't win, it was usually because we had massive injuries to the starting rotation, and that was the same thing last year. No Tristan McKenzie for basically the whole year. Um, Shane Bieber missed the majority of the year. And at the end of the day, this ball club's margin for error is not that great. They just they can't afford those kind of injuries. Now, if the starting pitching stays healthy for the most part, then this ball club's got a chance to hang in there because, you know, in all honesty, guys, the American League Central is by far the weakest division in all of baseball. It hasn't always been that way. People forget Kansas City and Cleveland represented the American League three straight years in the World Series, you know, in 2014, 15, and 16. But, boy, since then, we've had a lot of rebuilding going on with a lot of ball clubs. Um, again, I, I think Tito is as good a manager as the game has ever seen. But also, no matter how good you are as a manager, you can't overcome a multitude of injuries to starting pitching. You just don't have enough of it. Mm. So I, I think what's going to be interesting, and, and you brought up a good point on the seeing the young kids play. Look, guys, the most stunning development for me was Miles Straw, um, now becoming the Columbus Clippers starting center fielder. I mean, this guy still owed $19 million. He has whatever, three, four years left on his contract. And that's how much they want to see a guy like Tyler Freeman play. They want to see this youngster they got from the Yankees, Esteban Florial. You know, I feel bad for Miles Straw because I still think he's one of the elite center fielders in the game. And what you hope is Miles can go back to Columbus and, and figure it out from an offensive standpoint because this guy is a major leaguer. But, you know, he ran into a numbers crunch here, and I think it tells you how much Cleveland wants to see some of these young kids perform. Um, again, I think power is going to be limited. You know, I also think, guys, I know we're sitting here today, whatever it is, March 24th. I think by the middle of May, the 1st of June, this roster could look different. Yeah. I don't think Chase DeLauders is very far away. I don't think Kyle Manzardo is very far away as far as young players that could come up here and help this ball club. And so, you know, I don't think you're going to see guys get – 
six months to prove whether they can play or not. They're, they're going to get an extended amount of time to, to prove themselves. But there are other guys knocking on the door that could make this thing very interesting if guys get off to slow starts. Tom, I think something that I found interesting when I was uh, in Goodyear this spring was the noticeable shift in philosophy at the plate. I, I was talking to Will Brennan, and I asked him, is this something that the team has outwardly talked about? And he said, you know what, it is. Obviously, the last couple of years, it's been a contact-oriented team that ran the bases well, but did ha- that just did not have power. And I love the, well, the way Will phrased it. He said, look, just look around baseball and see what's going on. The teams that are winning are are hitting the long ball. So, yes, we've had discussions as a team to be less afraid to go up there and take a, a healthy hack. You're going to swing yeah. and miss. It's part of baseball. Have you noticed? And I, I, don't, I, I hate to compare. They are apples to apples, but the, they're hitting for more power this spring than they did last spring. And it does yeah. seem like there's something to this, that this is a new paradigm shift under Stephen Vogt where I think they're saying – Go up there and swing. You're going to miss. But we got we to gotta hit home runs if we hope to have any success at all. Yeah, I think, Jay, you know, the, the, the big point there is early in the count, they want guys to look for a pitch that they can drive and do, do some damage with, to your point. Now, one, I don't think we're a home run hitting team. I don't think we will be. But that doesn't mean you can't hit doubles. That's the, that was – we've never been a big home run hitting team. Since, obviously, the 90s. I mean, we've had ball clubs that could hit home runs much more so than this ball club. But just as big a deal as hitting for extra bases, getting that double that you – we have to get away from it takes us five base hits to score two runs in an inning. You know, get a few guys on and and score two runs with a double and, and look to do damage early in the count. Now, that being said, it's a fine line. One, they don't want guys to get so defensive about swinging and missing, that all they want to do is put the ball in play and it ends up being soft contact. However, if you get so enamored with trying to hit for power and you're not a power hitter, then you're you're not going to be successful either. So you got to walk that fine line. And, you know, Jay, you've been around enough in spring trainings. It always sounds good in spring training. And then come March 28th, you know, when all of a sudden you're playing in a ballpark that's got three decks instead of one, and you've got a major league pitcher out on the mound that is competing to get you out rather than just working on things, that philosophy can go out the window in a hurry. Well, it'll, yeah. I think it's, it'll be interesting to see how, how convicted they are because the, the old adage is everyone's got a plan when they leave the on-deck circle. <laughs> a lot of guys give up on that plan one pitch into the at-bat. So, <laughs> you know... That's going to be kind of an ongoing thing this year. But it was a point of emphasis, and, um, you know, it, we'll see. We'll see. I, I think at the end of the day, the power is going to have to come from, you know, the usual suspects, Jose Ramirez and, and Josh Naylor. But I, I do think there are enough guys on this club. You mentioned Will Brennan. I mean, gosh, a couple of years ago in the minor leagues, he had like 35, 36 doubles. Now, I know it's the minor leagues, but if you can get that kind of productivity, then the home runs aren't that big a deal. You know, Tom, speaking of Jose Ramirez, uh, thoughts on what you feel like this 2024 season will be like for Jose? And then a follow-up question to that, just to get your opinion. We've had conversations on this show that Jose gave the Guardians a discount and that it's our opinion that the Guardians haven't done much to really build a competitive team around him. To that, you say what? Goodbye. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. And <laughs> I'd like to keep working. <laughs> hey, um, sometimes you say a lot without saying nothing at all, Tom. Much respect, man. <laughs> you know, I think there have been, obviously, this this is a ball club that is limited as far as financial revenues. And it would really hurt a lot of ball clubs, not just Cleveland this uh, off season was the local television contract with Bally's. If, if you look around, what are there, 14 teams, I think, out of the 30 that have their games locally broadcast by Bally's or whatever they're called. Um, and so because of all of the financial issues that Bally's and Sinclair uh, have had, 
that really hamstrung a lot of ball clubs, including the world champion Texas Rangers. Right. Uh, they were limited financially with what they could do. So I think this offseason was an aberration. Look, you know, Cleveland's never going to be at the top of the food chain when it comes to, you know, being able to pay certain salaries. You know, at the end of the day, the biggest difference baseball has with the NFL, the NFL, everybody's on a level playing field. You know, to me, the beauty of the NFL is, I, I think in Chris Antonetti, Mike Chernoff and his people, there's not a smarter or better run front office in baseball. But they're competing with a payroll of, say, 90 to 100 million, and the Dodgers can go out and spend 300 million. Well, I'm from Wisconsin. The Cleveland Browns or the Dallas Cowboys or the New York Giants, they can't spend more than the Green Bay Packers. And that's why front offices make such a difference in the NFL because everybody's on the same playing field financially. That's the biggest discrepancy that we have in our game. To your point about Jose Ramirez, yes. But you know what? The beauty of Jose, he's happy. He was happy the day he signed that contract. He knew he was leaving money on the table, but he did not want to go out and become a free agent. He wanted to stay in Cleveland. And because of that, you know, he's going to become one of the greatest players to ever wear an Indian slash Guardians uniform. Um, I do think, though, that there's some help right around the corner. And, and I'm not just kind of trying to be Pollyanna right now. I think Chase DeLauders is really close. I think Kyle Manzardo is really close. Um, the ball club has the number one pick in the draft. And what we have seen lately, guys, especially – now, Cleveland's never had the number one pick in the draft ever. They got lucky because of the lottery. But they've got a chance to get a big-time impact college bat. And what we have seen here recently is when the teams like the Baltimore Orioles or somebody like that that's losing 110 games, they get that guy. They're in the major leagues quickly when they're coming from college. So I think this dynamic could change quite a bit. I think what's going to be interesting going forward, nobody talks much about it, is Shane Bieber. You know, yeah, for an organization Yeah, for an organization that prides itself on on starting pitching and rightfully so, they've developed more than arguably anybody in the game. Right now that I I don't see a lot of guys coming up. I don't see that next wave yet. Um, a lot of those guys are here, Gavin Williams, Logan Allen, Tanner Bybee. But Shane Bieber looks as good this spring as he's looked at any point in his career. He'll be a free agent. And, um, man, I would hate to lose this guy. I think he's a leader on this ball club. I think he leads that rotation. And those young kids have a guy to really, you know, look up to and follow. That's kind of been, if you look at it, you know, C.C. Sabathia had guys to follow. And then C.C. Sabathia became that leader. And then it was Cliff Lee. And, then it was Corey Kluber, and all these guys have had that one lead pony that kind of has ushered in the next wave of really good starting pitching, and that, that's Shane right now. Yeah, you answered my question because I think he's the linchpin to the whole season. If he can stay healthy and they can stick around and be in this race at the All-Star break and into July, it makes it really difficult for them to move on when they have a chance to win the division and then after this season, you know, who knows what happens. He probably signs as a free agent. Tom, we got to let you go. We'll be listening to you every day and every night. We hate Thank that they're guys. starting on the West Coast. That's garbage. We got to wait eight <laughs> games before we can watch our team. I think that's ridiculous. It's awful, but it is what it is. You'll be great this year. We can't wait to hear you. And uh, go you Guardians, guys. baby. Go Guardians. Thanks, Thanks so much. Tom. Thanks, it. guys. Enjoyed it. Have a good one. Thanks, too, Tom. Thanks, I literally Tom. could talk all day with this man because his baseball knowledge is unparalleled. He is the best, and we got to get one last thing awesome. in here real quick. Today was the first day of the UCSS newsletter. If you want to sign up, we'll make sure we put out that link to sign up in our community tab. Again, this is a quick little preview of what it looks like, but it's a recap of what we did the previous week on UCSS, a little preview of what's coming up ahead, and it is nicely put together with top fives and all that. That's really cool. I didn't know what I like you were doing This is the, the first UCSS time I've, I've written a short article, so to speak. Really? In a, in a long time. So I did 200 words on the first ever uh, UCSS newsletter. But I was going to tell you, the one thing about Tom, first of all, Tom, Tom Helmonton is one of the big three. Him, Jim Donovan, the late great Joe Tate, right? Oh. And I remember the first time I ever hosted a radio show on 92.3 The Fan, Ken Carmen, shout out to Ken Carmen. 
he told me, you got about two or three minutes to convince people they need to listen to you and not Tom Hamilton. And that's something I would never, <laughs> That's a high bar, forget. Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> that's something I'd never forget. <laughs> yeah, that, no, he's, he is the holy grail. He and Jimmy, uh, we're lucky, Cleveland. Very we're not going to have him forever, but we're lucky to have him yeah. now. And from high bars to crossbars, Cade York is back in Cleveland. Guys, Jay, this was your friend. This was your, this was your guy. He was my best. You had in, in, uh, invested a lot of stock in Cade York. I did. It did not work out. Dustin Hopkins came in last season and had a tremendous season kicking for the Browns. It's a future reserves deal. There's no kicking competition in camp. But what were your initial thoughts to hearing the Browns had brought back Cade York? Jay, Jay texted me and said, Project Stockpile. Yeah, that's pretty much what it is. Uh, look, I, I like the deal, but I, we've, we have our kicker. Um, you're right. There's, there's no competition. But what we've learned, um, and we learned it firsthand last year, kickers get hurt too. Yes, they do. Kickers get hurt too. Um, and I, I think it was a way for the Browns to show to Cade York, we still believe in you. Mm-hmm. And other teams should still believe in you too. My hope is he lands a job. In the, he's good enough. It, he, he's got he's got the skill set to be a kicker in the NFL. That is not debatable. Mm-hmm. Does he have it up here? And I think sometimes when teams believe in you, it's easier to go out and perform. So I, I think that when you add a player to the roster, I think that there has to be mutual interest, right? Because when we see this news, the first thing we talked about was, well, why would the Browns bring him back? But if you look at it from K York's perspective, he was cut from three different practice squads last year, and we are in free agency. So clearly, nobody was calling his agent, and maybe K York couldn't find a job to where, you know, it's got to be a humbling thing to go back to the team that drafted you, uh, cut you, and you know for a fact that they have a kicker that's going to be their place kicker it's for his the way, season. It's his way to keep, so, keep so, his board piece on the Monopoly. He got to keep himself relevant. Yeah, that's, that's what all, he's doing. And that's, that's what he's doing. And I think, the, I, I think it was a wise move by the Browns to give him that opportunity. They don't want to see him fail either. And I think on top of it, you, you had a situation where last year, the Browns went through something where they was looking like a, uh, a, a, a inner city school with no kicker. <laughs> That's you look like you look like Ted Ginn going for two every time. <laughs> Come on, man. Look, what are you going to do? Now, they're like, listen, how often do you have your punter and your kicker injured? Where oh. you're like, well, we can't just add these dudes to the roster. Right. So, look, they look. They was like, yeah, let's go get a guy with stockpile, you know, bring him on. And, and Kate York's back in town. You know where everything is at. But, uh... Does anyone here think he'll ever have a chance to yeah, kick gonna, in the NFL again? I was going to ask you. Yeah. I was going to say, does he have a chance to kick? Will he kick in a game for the Browns next year? I, barring an injury, no. No, but he will but, kick but in I his do league. think he will kick in the NFL again. He will again. kick in this league, and it wouldn't surprise me if, he, if he's good. Listen, he was good when he was in when college, right? Right, yeah. And he got to the NFL. You know, you have early success. You hit a, a what, 59, 60-yard game winner in your first career game. So I think it was a franchise record, wasn't it? And, and it's like... Those are the things that boost your confidence. But then he, he, he went through a whirlwind, right? He went through some adversity. And he's still trying to find his place in this league. He's going into his, what, third year? So be his second, third. Second yeah, he, third didn't play, he didn't play last his year third at all. Year. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, but he didn't play at all last year. The future is still really, really bright for this dude. I mean, you kick, he's only missed like 10 kicks in his eight life. 24 of 32. Career. He's missed eight, 10 eight, kicks eight, in eight, total. In total. Ten I, kick, and I, that's kind of crazy to think like, the world is over. I missed 10 right. kicks Someone's out of all Someone's going to need a kicker. Someone's going to sign him. He's going to make a roster. Um, it's just, it has to be in the right situation. And, you know, look, he kicked, he had some big time kicks in college. Uh, and he won a national championship. He's played at the highest level in college. We'll, we'll see what happens. You but how, I think he'll kick again in the NFL. You know how they say sometimes it's not what you do, it's how you do it. You know, the fact that he's only missed eight kicks in his career, it's not the fact that he's missed kicks. It's the yeah. kicks that he's missed at the time that he's missed Well, them. another saying I love that goes in step with that, it's not what happens to you. It's how you respond to what happens to exactly. you. And clearly, kickers are mental. It's like, a, it's like a golfer that gets the yips when he's putting. One putt leads, one bad putt leads to another bad putt, which leads to two more bad putts. Then you have the yips. He had the yips as a kicker. I've seen kickers and golfers come out of the yips. It can be done, but it has to happen here. The work, his body is fine. It's up here. He has to become stronger mentally. I hope he has. 
I'm sure he's done work on that. And um, I'd love to see him kick again in the league and have success. Just not for the Steelers, the Bengals, or the Ravens. <laughs> there you go. All right, uh, that's going to do it for our show. We would hope that there was going to be enough time for the NCAA tournament. We'll do it in overtime. We'll just talk a we'll little tournament do that in overtime. In overtime. Okay, yeah. I got a jet. I got an off-campus that I have to hit. Um, so I won't be able to do overtime. But you don't want me here anyhow because I basically – I the only NCAA tournament action I've seen was when I was in a restaurant eating dinner in Florida on vacation. I watched the end of the Kentucky game, that upset. I saw the end of the Florida game. And it was only because I was at a restaurant, it was on somewhere. It got elevated, off. right? But yeah, I, I'm just uh, really just, I did watch a little bit of the Ohio State Duke game yesterday. Uh, and again, enough to re-cement my position that the best basketball being played right now at the collegiate level is definitely on the women's side. Those teams. Uh, no, UConn's absolutely boat racing teams. Too. Oh, they're good. I, I do think UConn's going to win it easily again. That's it. Peace.